think we um, we are still missing a few members who are in transit, and so we'll just pause, take a pause, and catch folks up as we need to when they arrive. So I will gavel in the meeting, and we are now in order for the Early Learning Council for uh, Thursday, May 28th. Thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I do believe we have a couple of members on the phone, and in just a minute I'll have Alyssa call the roll. Um, uh, but while we are doing that, just a couple of logistical or opening announcements. They've changed, since the last time we met in this room, they've changed the, um, the PA or the public uh, microphone system. So particularly if you're on the sides, uh, you're going to really need to project in order for people on the phone to hear. Although we, we have tried to place some microphones around. If you're on the sides, I'd ask that you just really project. Also, um, council members who are in the room, you have um, a reimbursement form. If some of us do that, some of us don't do that. But uh, if you would like to avail yourself of that, you can either fill it out before you leave and give it to Alyssa, or you can uh, mail it back in. OK? And um, then I also, uh, just while we're doing the logistical announcements, I'm going to need to step out. I got called to a, a legislator's office across the street. So I will be handing the gavel to Charles about 10 o'clock. And Charles will um, chair the meeting and while I am out. And I'll be back about 10.45. OK, so with that, Alyssa, can I ask you to call the roll, please? Pam Curtis. Here. Vicki Bishop. Here. Martha Brooks. On the phone. Great. Janet Doherty Smith. Here. Tim Freeman. Here. Uh, Kelly. <coughs> Charles McGee. Here. Eva Ripito. Here. Krista Rude. Here. Lynn Saxton. Here. Terry Tallhoffer. Here. Bobby Weber. Here. Kim Williams. Here. Do we have Marlene Yesquin on the phone? Not yet. Rob is on his way and Megan Irwin. Here. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, on our agenda today, uh, we have um, several uh, interesting reports and interesting conversations to be had. So let me just give you a little sneak preview of how we plan to do the meeting and then see if there are other items that you want to add to the agenda that aren't represented <coughs> here. So um, I have a chair's report to give, um, and we'll focus on the engagement survey results in that report, which are behind tab one in your binder. Uh, Megan has um, a director's report to give, and in that we want to talk a little bit about the pro proposed committee structure um, and um, how, how we want to work with committees going forward. The ex your executive committee has been hard at work with that. That's behind tab two in your binder. We had originally planned to have Lindsey Caps from the governor's office with us to do the legislative update, but he also got called to a, a members, it tis the season, right, um, office. And so he won't be with us, and instead Megan will give the legislative update. Um, so you can note that on your agenda. And then we'll go into committee reports. We have uh, several committee reports that are written behind tab three in your binders. Those we intend to acknowledge um, just by a consent agenda, unless there's something in one of those reports you want to bring forward. So I'll just give you that heads up now. So if there's something in one of those reports you want to bring forward for discussion, um, we will do that under subcommittee reports. Um, and then we want to talk, uh, we're going to turn to the equity subcommittee, uh, and we want to have a bit of a follow-up conversation from the last council meeting. And what we want to focus on there is your reflections and how you, what your thinking is about how you want to manage these issues as a council going forward, right? So we're not going to rehab the conversation we had last time. We're going to talk about going forward. Since Marlene, who chairs that committee, is on the phone, uh, Sarita has agreed to lead that conversation with us here in the room. We have a uh, rules uh, process. Uh, discussion and decision uh, to make. Bobby will lead that as chair of our rules committee. And then we have a follow-up item from uh, the prenatal to age three committee, which we established last meeting. And uh, uh, Martha will do that. She's on the phone. Then we want to talk about uh, child care resource and referral. Uh, every so many years, the state um, <coughs> uh, 
needs to submit a report. We're going to give a preview of that report, and um, Don Woods and Heidi McGowan are here to do that. And in addition to that, we have parents from the work groups that we've been holding related to the Child Care Resource and Referral who will be there to give us here to give us their parent <coughs> perspectives. Uh, and then we will fi uh, finish up our official meeting with um, a follow-up conversation around communications, um, which we started last time. And then we'll go to public testimony. So, council members, are are there any other items that you know that we need to cover today that are not represented here on this agenda, Lynn? I don't. This may fit in the agenda, or or it may fit in another box. So I defer to um, collective wisdom. But it would be great in some manner to have a hub dashboard at each meeting showing each hub's. Um, each hub's advances and status, and it could be just a simple little grid showing key facts, but I'd really like to be tracking hubs. Um. Great, thank you, so noted. Obviously, great idea, too early for today. Yeah. But <laughs> we can we can look, work on something along those lines. I think I'm looking at Megan and, and Alyssa. It looks like we'll work on something for maybe the next meeting. Thank you. Council members, other items that are not represented currently on this agenda? Pam, Bobby? did I miss about the um, where the uh, application process for joint for uh, populating our committees? We're going to handle that under the uh, director's report. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Other items, council members? Pam, I have a yes. With the um, changes with the OEIB um, and our relationship to that, is there any? change or we don't know or we do know and we will include that as part of the legislative update conversation okay. mm -hmm. right anything else council members okay great so uh, with that we'll move to the chair's report and um, the first thing I want to do is to call your attention to tab one in your binder and council members, you will remember that uh, most of you participated in what we called an engagement survey what, using the Survey Monkey and Electronic Tool, where we asked you to uh, give us some information about how you see your work on the council, what your hopes are, where you think we're doing a good job, where you think we need to really shore up, what committees you might like to work on. And we'll come back to the <laughs> committee part under Megan's report. But I wanted to. Um, uh, call your attention to the summary of the findings which are in your binder behind tab one <clears throat> and uh, I would invite you to just spend some time looking through this particularly in advance of our planning retreat where we're going to set at post legislative session where we will also sort of set our trajectory for the next year or two um, there's a lot of really good information in these results that I think can help inform those directions going forward um, on the first page however there's just a, a pretty high level summary of uh, some of the responses that were received staff did a nice job of summarizing them I think how many do we have 15 responses? I can't remember how many. 17. 17 responses. So 17 of us, 17 of the 19 <clears throat> uh, council members participated, which is a great, great response. Um, and if you look at the table that is at the top of the first page behind tab one, you'll see some of the common threads that came through in multiple places. And so just for the interest of folks in the audience, um, I won't read those specifically, but I think that those common threads sort of fall into two groups. Um, one is in terms of what we need to do better. Um, one has to do with meeting logistics, you know, setting meeting calendars in advance and making sure parking arrangements are made and making sure we have the right materials at meetings and those kinds of things. Um, the other bucket, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, is a series of things that we probably can do to make folks feel more engaged um, in the both in the meetings and in and around the meetings. And so therefore some of the committee um, process work that uh, that Megan will talk about in her report and then kind of on the plus side folks really felt that we have a great staff that are very responsive um, and professional and kudos to them so those are the high high level summaries but I really would invite you to dive in um, some more to this and we'll come back to it 
particularly at our retreat. Any initial reactions, council members, that you want to share? I know we're seeing this all for the first time. But I have notes all over the place, but if we're having a bigger discussion. Well, other than the packet, yes, yeah. that's right. I'll leave it for later. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, then I want to also call your attention in tab one, I think it is the last item in tab one, is the nomination form for the Lynn England Award, which um, I'll turn it over to Bobby in just a second so she can give kind of the history here as we've done, as she's done in the past. But now this is an award that we give every year to honor uh, outstanding contributions to our child care and education system. So, Bobby, do you want to give us a bit of a history about the Lynn England Award and then we can focus in on the nomination form? Okay. <clears throat> the most important part of the award is the person. Lynn was a um, highly committed businesswoman who served on our Commission for Child Care, which got merged into us <laughs> with the legislation. And on, uh, she lived in Bend and on her way over the mountain to a, count, uh, to a commission meeting, um, sh she was uh, killed in an accident. And so the commission at this point um, took uh, this horrible tragedy as an opportunity. Um, that's a pretty unsung group of people, the ones who work with our youngest children. And um, they don't get recognized, and so they created, the commission created this award. So it's, uh, it's pretty wide open, but it's um, to, to carry on the advocacy and support. So Lynn was a businesswoman, it can be a businesswoman, it can be any, anybody who has shown a commitment to strengthening um, young children in Oregon, and they, it could be uh, work in any area and on any issue, safety, quality, affordability, access, availability, delivering the services, high quality <coughs> services. And so we ask that people uh, take this advantage and think of the unsung heroes and this is an opportunity for us to recognize them. Great, thank you very much. So we will uh, plan to give this award at a fall meeting. Um, the nomination form is in your packet, council members. Um, it's also available on the web, I think, yes. And um, the submission deadline for applications is uh, June 22nd. You can submit hard copy, you can submit online, and the instructions are here. So feel free to, to do that. Lynn? Can we send online or put online the previous recipients? Oh, that's a great uh, idea. So that people yeah. can know, you know, the scope. I think it's been a pretty wide-ranging, impressive group of people. Right. And um, and then also, if it's less than 250 words, is that okay, or is this an assignment? <laughs> <laughs> I just think it can be. You want to know what I have? Or less. Or less. Okay. Or less. It's okay. the or less Thank part. You. All right. Anything else about the Lynn England Award, council members? All right, so the last thing I had on my um, uh, chair's report, speaking of awards, um, this is Rob Saxton's last official meeting with us as an early learning council member. Um, in just a minute, we'll let Rob talk about uh, where he's off to. Um, but I have to say that we had a nice award uh, uh, made up for Rob, like we did for Dick and um, Norm and others before him. But when we got it back last night, Rob, and we were reading through it, it said that we were honoring you for your years of dedication to the deputy superintendent. So we were <laughs> honoring uh, you for your dedication to yourself. And well, maybe you <laughs> are dedicated to yourself. We really wanted to honor you for your dedication to young children. So we will have that redone. And um, that means we don't have your award with us today. But we really appreciate um, all that you have done, uh, certainly across your career, but I think you've brought some really interesting and important perspective to this conversation and this group, and we're going to miss um, your participation, and we, we wish you luck going forward. Thank I'm not sure that everybody knows where you're going or what uh, you're planning to do, but um, mm -hmm. I, we're hoping to continue to see you. Uh, thank you. I'm sure you will, so I'm, I'm going to be the uh, superintendent of the Northwest Regional ESD, which is uh, also a hub. And so um, it's 
makes sense for me to not be uh, here maybe although it's maybe not too so um anyway i'm gonna go do that and i'm really excited about it i think it gives me an opportunity to um, take some of the learning that i've had in my current role and um, run it to ground in a really different way um, out of the northwest region it's the area that I, of the state that i worked in for quite a while and so i'm very familiar with uh, the four counties that are served by the esd out there columbia clatsop tillamook and washington and um, with the people in the communities and uh, some of the services that are provided by the ESD. And it's a, I think it's just a really good chance to go out there and hopefully um, make some of the work that we've been um, setting policy around at the department uh, come to life a little bit. And hopefully also some of the work that you all have been doing with the hub. I'm, I, I'm actually very, very excited about that. And when you think about the opportunity um, just around collective impact, that exists in that kind of a service organization, uh, I think it can be really fun. Um, this has been uh, wonderful for me, lots of learning, and um, appreciated always being able to participate. And, and uh, when somebody says you provide a unique perspective, it means sometimes you're a little off, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I get that, us. and that's okay. <laughs> sometimes being that way is good. I thought you for sure you're going to say that the plaque came back and said, Ron Saxton. <laughs> <laughs> Glad that that wasn't the case, although it would have been fine as well. It would be an honor to have somebody um, put the N instead of the D at the end of the name. So anyway, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll look forward to seeing you and working with you in a different capacity. Yes, Lynn. I, I just want to give a shout out to Rob Saxton <laughs> um, because for throughout the last, you know, four or five years, Rob has um, done an exceptional job of saying things that need to be said that may not be popular, may not be well received, and always says them with this kind of lovely intelligence and calm that lets the message get through to all of us. And so I have heard him on OPB many times driving up the freeway, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe he's saying that, and it needs to be said, and thank you for doing it. But I also just want to give a shout out that Rob um, deserves tremendous credit for doing an exceptional job in his role as superintendent of Tigard Schools before he came to the state. And Tigard Schools have, um, have really been an example of how to achieve in the Oregon framework for kids. And he has relentlessly throughout his career Nev never taken his eye off the kids and families and what they need. So um, kudos to you. Kudos for tolerating all the confusion with which Saxon you are. Because <laughs> I think both of our Saxons would think would rather be you. <laughs> but, um, but good work. And uh, we really look forward to I'm so excited that you're going to a hub, because I think that bodes well for advancing the Early Learning Council's objectives, but mostly Thank you for serving the people of Oregon in a truly remarkable way. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I promise you you're way too kind, but I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> and um, just so people know, we don't intend to be a hub. We intend to be the hub. <laughs> Throwing down, right? Yeah. So Throwing down. The, the, to, to Lynn's point, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for everything. We'll look forward to working with you continually in a continued way. All right, Megan, I think it's to you for the director's report. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I have two things in my director's report today, but I also just want to jump really quickly on the saying thanks to Rob train and just say on the record, thank you so much for everything that you've done to support me in the role that I'm in now and everything that you've taught me over the last two years. I'm going to miss you as a colleague so much. So. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And for the Same record, here. one of the strongest superintendents on early childhood now, um, given this experience. So really excited to have you going where you're going. Thanks, Rob. Um, so the other two things that I have today are I need to let the council know about a couple other staff transitions um, that I'm both happy and sad about um, of members of my team who you all have worked with enough that I want to let you know that they're leaving and where they're going and what that's all about. Um, and also let you know that we're now hiring for their positions and I need your help recruiting. Um, and then second, and the more substantive part of my um, director's report is to dig into and get your feedback on how we want to uh, move forward with populating the council's standing committees. 
with um, non-ELC members. So you all went through a process of letting us know which committees you want to be on, and we're going to sort you based on your preferences. But we also want to establish a process for how we um, allow members of public to uh, members of the public to self-select onto our committees, um, and get into a little bit more of a routine around the committee work, um, which I think is one way that this group will build social capital among each other, which is one of the things that came out really strongly in the engagement survey that you're all creating. So we'll get to that proposal in a second. Um, but let's start with um, a little bit of a celebration um, and uh, happy and sad news. So it's a sad celebration, I guess. Um, but um, <laughs> Sarita Amaya has um, been recruited by the Beaverton School District um, to serve as the vice principal of El Monica Elementary School. And um, she accepted the position because her dream ultimately is to be a superintendent one day, and she will be an amazing superintendent when she gets there, and this is an important step on that career path for her. So even though I am heartbroken that she's leaving, I'm really happy that she's leaving for the kind of role that she's leaving for because of the impact she can have um, for kids in that community. Um, and I'm happy and grateful because we got to have nine months of her work um, here at the division and she's been instrumental in helping us find a way to not just talk about the equity lens but to actually start to operationalize what it means and she's laid a, a really strong foundation. When she gets here later I have a little recognition for her that I want to pause and also give you guys the chance to thank her because she's just been key for the work of this council and for the division. Um, and we're now hiring, actively hiring and recruiting for a replacement for her for the equity director role. So if you have you or you, members of the public listening to this, have <coughs> thoughts on who might be a good fit, please send them my way. I'm meeting people for coffee, talking about the role, really actively recruiting for that position. Um, and then second, Amy Craig, who's our public affairs director, and you've worked with her a lot and you'll see her later today, has made a very hard personal decision to um, stop working for a little while and be a mom to her three-year-old son. And so um, I'm really proud of her for making this decision on behalf of her family. It was a very difficult decision for her to make, um, but it's, it's where her heart really is at. So she'll be with us until August 1st. She's sticking around to have a long transition period, but we're also now act, sort of actively recruiting for a public affairs director. So two outstanding women that I feel so <coughs> blessed to have had the chance to work with are moving on, and we'll just have to find two more outstanding people to fill in behind them and say thank you to, to them when you see them. Um, so that's the, the sort of ELD staffing report for you. Um, any questions about that? I just wanted to make sure that the council knew you'll see some new faces soon because we have a little bit of turnover happening. Okay. Um, so then the second part of my report is to dig into this proposed committee process, and you have that under tab two with a brief board action summary in front of you, and then it's a very brief proposal. I mean, this is really just the nuts and bolts of what I'm thinking we might do and have vetted it with our executive committee and now want and need your feedback. Um, so a little bit of context here. I've been working with Alyssa, who, if you didn't know, um, we've promoted out of being my executive assistant into a role where she's now the um, early learning council administrator solely. Um, and we've been working on really building out some operational guidance for this body. So Alyssa is putting together a policies and procedures <laughs> manual um, for each of you. And through the process of doing that, we've also realized that we actually do need to add a little bit more structure around how our council committee work functions, especially because coming out of this legislative session, we are going to have a ton of really important implementation work to do. We're gonna talk about what that looks like when we get to the legislative report. Um, and we're gonna to have to have committees that are really just locked and loaded and ready to go for us to move the implementation work um, coming out of the legislative session through uh, you as a policy body and for us to be able to really move on and act on the strategies that you put in your strategic plan. Um, so that's kind of why we think the standing committee structure is so important. And you already know which ones we have. They're here in the document, so I won't read them to you. And you've told us which ones you want to serve on. We're matching you to, uh, to your interests and we should have that um, figured out by the end of June. And then each committee chair is working on finalizing a charter and sort of thinking through how they are gonna stage the work out of the committee over the course of the next year. 
um, and we'll get really clear about which parts of the strategic plan need to move through which committee by your July meeting and then by your September retreat we'll be really ready to go I think what we don't have established yet is a consistent <coughs> process for how uh, we populate the committees with members of the public um, and so I'm proposing here one that's relatively simple um, essentially upon your approval or any changes you want to make to this process and then upon your approval um, we would post on our website and send out via email um, an all call for members of the public um, to nominate themselves or nominate others uh, to serve on the three early learning council committees that have slots open right now um, we will accept nominations and applications through the month of June and then um, in July the executive committee will look at the applications sort of decide um, which committees folks should serve on based on interest experience um, making sure that we have really diverse representation across the committees that we are putting together and we'll bring their recommendation forward to you all in July to approve um, the applications will be available in English Spanish and Russian um, and Alyssa is conducting a composition analysis right now of our current committees and our past committees going back a year so that um, we can identify where we've had gaps in representation to make sure that we're bringing those perspectives forward in the next round of our work um, so that's really all that I had to say to you guys about the context around this proposal and then you have it in front of you and it's short and I'm assuming that you read it as part of prep so I'm not going to read it to you really just seeking feedback um, any changes you would make and then hopefully your acceptance and endorsement so we can move forward on on getting this work rolling great so let's open this for conversation Lynn well things I think it would be a great idea to um, we do this with the CCOs in our organization but to encourage the hubs to either um, have members on those committees either to recruit directly from the hubs or or alternatively make hub designated slots on those committees so that they're on it um, and the other thing is would be a great idea to involve the hubs in interviewing prospective candidates for the positions in the agency um, just to foster engagement and integration thank you council members other comments questions or feedback on the proposal that's in front of you again this has been vetted through the executive committee so far so this is minor but um, when we ask are they affiliated with the group I think it's always good to put other and let them say so if somebody doesn't see themselves they don't think we're saying you're not wanted oh um, on the application yes. form yeah okay oh, great. yes and then if we followed up on Lynn <clears throat> we could maybe add a question are you uh, working with any of the early learning hubs and just have an additional question maybe that sounds yep. great yeah and if folks want to see like what we were that we're trying to keep the nomination form simple and they're in your packet if you want to see what that looks like as well oh. so yeah those are great suggestions Bobby we'll add those Additional suggestions, <coughs> questions, thoughts? <coughs> Thank you. I know this is very processy, but it truly is in the service of you guys getting what you need to do your work in an efficient way. OK, okay. council members, any objection? Then what we will do is adjust based on the feedback so far, um, which is about uh, a, a hub involvement connection potentially involving hubs and interviewing making those uh, associated changes to the nomination form that Bobby mentioned so is there any objection to moving forward then council members okay we are moving forward then thank you so much all right anything else on director's report no, okay good. we'll just want you just keep, <laughs> just going. keep yeah. talking just okay. keep talking Megan uh, this <laughs> legislative report so I will now uh, be a poor stand-in for Lindsay Capps who's our education <clears throat> policy advisor out of the governor's office and he was looking forward to being here for like a month and we even talked about it on Wednesday and then he texted me this morning at like 645 that he has to be at the Capitol so he'll try to pop in if he can but I wouldn't count on it um, the number one thing that Lindsay wanted to make sure that I told you all before I talk about where we're at in the legislative session is that um, Gov Governor Brown is incredibly supportive of early childhood education and she's made 
the early learning package that we are working through the building right now, her number one education priority for this session. And she's also put early childhood education at the centerpiece of her education agenda, as, as a centerpiece of her education agenda overall. So I just wanted to make sure that this body got to hear that message on behalf of the governor um, via Lindsay. Um, so what I thought I would do is just kind of let you know where we're at in general with the legislative session, talk about a couple of bills specifically, and also speak to the question that Janet raised about what's going on with the OEID um, and what does that mean for you. So um, in general, things are going really well at the State House right now. Um, the governor uh, decided to fully back the early childhood proposal that we put forward in December. Um, so that's the package that's made up of an increased investment in employment-related daycare, an increased investment in home visiting, an investment in a new preschool model, an investment in the hubs, an investment in our kindergarten partnership and innovation fund work, and an investment in early childhood intervention and early childhood special ed. So we've been championing that package all session long. Um, and I would say that we're at the point legislatively where there's um, substantive support for the content of the proposal and what we're really talking about now is money. Um, how much money goes to which investment out of a limited pool. And um, we continue to push for full funding of the package as proposed. Um, the co-chairs of our subcommittee and the co-chairs of Big Ways and Means continue to push for a package that's funded at a little bit less. And we're just going to keep negotiating till we get to the point where a budget's decided on and finalized. But I think being in a place where we're not trying to convince people that early childhood is important um, and folks are willing to invest in it and we're having a conversation now about how much and what does that look like, that's a really nice spot for us to be in. And I'm just really grateful that the work of this body over the past couple of years with the legislature has gotten people to the point where we don't have to convince them that early childhood education is important. We don't have to sell people on it as much. We are just talking about how much are you able to invest given current fiscal conditions. Um, any questions about that? How much is the revenue for? I mean, the revenue forecast was good. Does that have any, are they thinking as a result that maybe they could get to fully funding the proposed <laughs> plan? Um, or, I mean, I guess I'm wondering what was the impact of that for this, for our um, pieces? We think the impact was positive. Um, but I have, yet, I have yet to be in a conversation where anybody's willing to say, well, the revenue forecast was great, so now we can fund this full package because I think that folks just aren't willing to show those cards and there's other priorities that we're compete that we are competing with um so you know the, the conversation is the revenue forecast was good and how do and we still have to figure out how we chunk funds into the different buckets with early childhood being the governor's highest priority but not necessarily everyone else's highest priority to put funds in so the governor feels like let's put funding into early childhood first um, but we're negotiating interests of other of other people. And which pieces do they have most interest in? Because I know that there were different pieces of the puzzle that the governor, in, initially, the, there were people saying, we got to take that off the table, but we'll keep this on. Sort of where do things stand now, and are there pieces that they're thinking they're more likely to fully fund versus others? Uh, for the early learning package, we're going for investment in the full, in the full okay. time. So I will not. say that she, uh, Governor Brown is really leaning in on the mixed delivery preschool piece. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That's one that she's really been, uh, that's one where there's maybe a little bit of disagreement about investment level, and she's really leaned in on full, the full 30, the full 30 million that we've requested and made that a very high priority. Yeah. So then that gets to the next piece I wanted to just kind of gear you guys up to think about legislatively. Um, there are some, a lot of what we're advocating for is just straight budget increases, like for the home, for home visiting, we're just asking for an increase to an existing program. For the hubs, we're asking for an increase in um, over their current service level. But there are a couple of areas where <clears throat> we're asking for funding to do things that are new, um, where this council is gonna play a big role in figuring out what that actually looks like in the state of Oregon. And the first and probably biggest um, one of those areas is the mixed delivery preschool bill. So it's House Bill 3380, and the bill is constructed in a way where it establishes a framework for a mixed delivery preschool in our state. That means preschool that serves kids up to 200% of the poverty level, level 
in a variety of settings, including childcare, community-based organizations, schools, and existing OPK Head Start. And, in, and the bill leaves a lot, lot of areas where the council is gonna have to make decisions about X. So that's one where we'll do the rule promulgation for it through the committee that Bobby's <coughs> the chair of, the Child Care and Early Education Committee. But there are a lot of decision points along the way that this council is gonna have to engage with. So get ready for that. Um, similarly with the Kindergarten Partnership and Innovation Fund, we are just, we're asking for an increase in funding for that fund um, and we'll be coming in July with a proposal for you all to help us think about now that the hub <coughs> system exists, um, what do, how do we establish and get those funds out to the field because two years ago there was no hub system and we constructed it a little bit differently as a result. Um, you may want to make some adjustments to how we've constructed that fund. And then the final piece, which connects to ERDC but is part of a bigger conversation about child care in general, is I think that over the course of the next year, this council is going to need to engage with us a lot as a division around child care policy reform. Um, and that looks like implementing the employment-related daycare bill that's working its way through the legislature right now. But we also have big changes to the Child Care Development Fund that you guys got a preview of at your January meeting. Race to the Top is ending, which has supported a lot of our work around child care. Um, and that's just going to be an area, a policy area, where we'll really need this council to engage um, coming out of session. So um, that's just a preview of what's coming. And then to uh, just speak to where the various bills are at that we've been tracking and that we care a lot about. They're all at Ways and Means. So Senate Bill 213, which was the bill that made hubs permanent, is at Ways and Means. The preschool bill, at Ways and Means. ERDC bill, at Ways and Means. Um, House Bill 2016, which Charles, if you want to say anything about, I would, I would invite you to. Um, but it's a bill that, that will establish an African-American student plan, um, is also at Ways and Means. Um, and that has important implications for this committee as well. So everything's just kind of sitting there waiting. Um, the, the committee should start to hear policy bills in the next two weeks or so and vote them out of committee and then we don't who knows when the budget gets done but sometime in the next six weeks questions about that before I talk about OEIB then <clears throat> the um, in the hub grid that we're gonna look at one of the things that is an opportunity and particularly post session depending on what happens with what bills is that the state now has a pretty clear read on where the CCOs are. They're pretty clear read and data on where the CCOs are and the hubs together. And then a bill is probably gonna be passed that changes and modernizes the public health system in Oregon. So that's a tremendous opportunity of lots of things being in motion and syncing up to a result um, and, and I think we need to, on the hub grid, we should first of all identify hubs that are integrated in some way with CCOs, because that's, that's a fascinating thing to watch. Um, and then as this public health piece unrolls or rolls out or um, develops, there's an opportunity there for the early learning system to be leveraged by a lot of the federal investments that are made through the public health system across the state. So that's just an opportunity to kind of do that thing that we envisioned with the hubs, which is to integrate to a result. So we'll want to have some kind of work session in that subcommittee that works with the healthcare system on how public health modernization rolls out and how that relates to um, our work. Mm -hmm. Other questions, <clears throat> excuse me, about the legislative package of bills. We'll talk about OEIB and those implications next, but questions about <clears throat> the budget that we have, any of the bills that are associated with them, status. Krista. Um, I, you mentioned that for House Bill 3380 that the rule promulgation happens through the committee that Bobby chairs. I'm also wondering about the ERDC and the uh, will those other bills and rule promulgation also be passing through committee or will those be um, worked on by staff and brought here? Um, great question. Any time we have any rules going forward as a, as a council, it will go through 
the uh, child care and early education committee that Bobby's the chair of and actually during her co her committee update she's going to talk we finally have fleshed out what that rule process looks like and she's going to talk about that um, the only bill that's coming out of this session that has rules that need promulgation um, is mixed delivery preschool but don't think that that means that you guys don't have a lot of rules to promulgate because we have a lot of really out of date ones that need to move forward. But um, that's the only new set that we'll be creating from scratch right now. But even revisions, all of that all stuff revisions, will all everything. go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yep. you. Okay, so let's talk about OEIB um, quickly just to let folks know what's going on. Um, the, Can I just interrupt you for oh, a second? Yeah. Just to draw <coughs> connections <coughs> then to the previous <coughs> conversation. So part of what we're trying to do on parallel tracks here is the legislative process is doing what it does. We're trying to get ourselves organized as a committee structure so that we are ready to hit the ground running yeah. uh, in July when we know the answer to all of the various questions that are being uh, considered at the moment. And so part of that is our committee structure and how committees function, which you just looked at. Part of that is, <clears throat> excuse me, having a framework and a policy for how we consistently handle rules across all of the various, to your point, um, all of the various potential rules that could be coming our way or that we already know are coming our way. So Bobby will talk about that, but there's a lot of kind of get ourselves organized work. And then to draw the, fr uh, the further dot to the, um, the survey that you all filled out you'll remember that one of the one of the themes that came from that was not only the need to be more organized logistically but the need to feel like people are more engaged in that operational work so we're trying to connect all of those dots here and I just wanted to make it explicit for you so thanks mm -hmm. um, so my last piece before I'm done is just to make sure you guys know what's going on with OEIB so mm -hmm. this legislative session was the session that the legislature had to consider the future of the Oregon Education Investment Board because its sunset um, was co is coming would, was coming up in 2016, and so um, the legislation, if you want to look it up, is a bill called Senate Bill 215, and Senator Roblin led a work group since the start of the session, really until now of education stakeholders to consider what the future of the OEIB should be. And I participated in that work group on behalf of early learning, although the focus really was predominantly K-12 and higher ed on that group. Um, and the report that the recommendation that that group ultimately came out with and that went forward and was voted out of the rules committee this week is um, to abolish the board. So the Oregon Education Investment Board is going to sunset but to keep the agency. And so the agency will change from the OEIB to the Office of the Chief Education Officer um, and will serve a couple of really key purposes. Number one, um, doing convening work uh, to solve problems. So uh, really operationalizing that barrier busting role that the Chief Education Officer, Nancy, um, is filling. So they'll convene around tricky, persistent problems and help come up with solutions for how to overcome them. They'll also be responsible for coordinating and sort of pushing collaboration across the different sectors of education along the pathway. So that key transitions work that OEIB has been leading on will continue. So for us, that means our work um, into the K-12 system to transition kids from early childhood into kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And then the third function that they'll perform is research. Um, so doing research to inform <coughs> the work that we're doing on behalf of the education system and the kids in it. So that's what the structure is gonna look like. Um, in terms of what that means for this council, um, I'm not sure that that much changes, except that we no longer have the board for you to connect with and bounce ideas off of. Um, but there will be some kind of convening entity that works with Nancy and probably meets quarterly and will be made up of members of each board that oversees parts of the, the system. So members of this council, members of the HEC, members of the State Board of Education will come together on a quarterly basis to sort of advise Nancy around the key transitions. Um, so that's what it's going to look like. This board will continue to be appointed by the governor. This position will continue to be appointed by the governor. Um, so the big change is the loss of the board itself and a little bit of shifting in, in <laughs> how governance and advice is going to work. Um, can, can you describe, so from the governor, where does the staff that work in OEIB answer what is the chain up and 
and we've always been so closely connected to OIIB. Can you, does this at all affect? Um, I know you just said it doesn't affect us, but I'm just still <coughs> trying to put the pieces together. Yeah, so every, uh, so in terms of staff, every education director in the state is a governor's appointee. So Nancy's position is appointed by the governor, um, deputy superintendent, my <coughs> position, Ben's position, Iris Bell's position. So the leadership of the, the agency part of the education system is all appointed by the governor. That's who we answer to in addition to our various boards. And then our staff answer to us. So the staff of the OEIB report to Nancy, who reports to the governor's office. There's no more, there's no uh, more direct connection between OEIB and us than that? No. Okay, yeah. thank you. Bob, is there anything you would add? I no, mean, we've I, been part I, of, you've been part of these right. conversations too. What am I, I missing? I think you have it exactly right. Yeah. Um, it looks like something that's so complex, but it really is fairly simple, and yeah. I think that uh, Megan has it exactly right. What is the name again, the Office of? Um, I think I could be getting the order of the words wrong, but I think it's the Office of the Chief Education Officer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I had it as Chief Education Office, but. Yeah. <laughs> Something with those words in yes. it. Okay. <laughs> Fair, Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. That's exactly right. Well, they continue to push. So one of the things that the the OEIB did was push values around equity, um, and I'm wondering, will there be a continued focus on you know equity lens and and equity throughout the continuum of education? And who is going? Is that something that Nancy will champion? The dep you know, one of the things that I love about Rob is that he was very good about championing that from the deputy superintendent role and really gave a voice to it in places that I don't think um, it was always easy to speak to it to. And so I guess I wonder, what is that vision and plan of making sure that we're helping most underserved kids? I don't think we're back, we're not backing away from it. It's staying just as strong front and center front, from Nancy. Um, I am sure that Dr. Knorr will also be a champion and then myself, Iris and Ben also have really taken on the taken the, the adoption of the equity lens seriously and so we're pushing it from a, from every level of leadership I do think to, to your point to add to that you know I think we'll talk in a few minutes about what this council's hopes are in terms of going forward I think maybe it it, it makes it even more important that we actualize what we talk about in terms of that I also think that we, we know that part of where we lose kids particularly kids of color and low-income kids that are in those transition zones. And so whatever ends up being this quarterly convening around how we look at that across the entire system, whichever of us end up being and those meetings really have to carry that forward. Mm -hmm. so. Other thoughts, comments about the OEIB? The news from across the street and by the time I see you all together again it will be over and we'll know what we'll know what happened <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll at least know what our budget is <laughs> yeah. we'll know what yeah. passed and what the numbers are yeah. <laughs> and then we'll try to figure out what happened right yeah. yeah okay very good well thank you very much we're gonna move to um, subcommittee reports uh, which is item five on your agenda council members and it's behind tab three <coughs> in your binders and so the first um, the first order of business is to acknowledge the receipt of the written reports which are found in your binders and then after that we want to go on and have um, a follow-up conversation around equity rules which we just talked about a moment ago and um, then the the prenatal to three committee which we established at our last meeting but uh, there are written reports from our committees behind tab three is there any need to bring anything in these committee reports forward ask again any need to bring any of the committee reports that are in written format forward okay. Lynn um, so one of the things that I think would be helpful, and this kind of goes to the hub grid too, is is in the narrative, 
in the in each of the committees and each of the narratives it's hard to track progress because it it reports out and if you're there you know well we got there from the last meeting we got from there to there but if you're just a member of the council and you're trying to track progress it's a little more complicated so I think it would be good to have some kind of tools for each committee in terms of mm. here's what we're <clears throat> wanting to get done, here's how far we are getting it done, here's what we're doing next, or something that, that allows us to kind of track how we're doing. So let me ask a follow-up question. So the executive committee has been meeting and talking a bit about the charter and the charge of each work group and how we keep track of all of that. So one of the things that the executive committee will be doing once we sort of get who's going to be on the committees and the charters is to tie each of the committees to sections of the strategic plan for the council including the indicators of progress for those. Will that accomplish it? Yeah, or are you that's exactly right. <coughs> okay. That's the All right. right time. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, I just want to make sure that that yeah. would suffice for what yep. you're thinking about. Yep. All right, Krista. On the best beginning subcommittee last uh, meeting, I had a question about the engagement of early Head Start representatives on that committee. And I'm looking at the membership section under Article 3, page 2. And it looks to me like um, it kind of has stayed the same and there's not a specific call out to that. So my next request would be, is there any way of somehow um, prioritizing or in the process of recruitment ensuring that there's representation? There's significant federal investment around early head start and child care partnerships and also it's a big area that I think is growing so thinking about how to link that system into this work mm -hmm. would be really helpful okay Martha I know you're on the line Martha chairs that committee were you able to hear that feedback Martha I heard very little of it I'm sorry I'm at a conference so I have stepped down the hall if you could repeat what the question was? Sure. Uh, it's Pam. I will try to repeat. It was from Krista. <clears throat> and um, tell me if I don't get it accurate, but uh, and I'm going to summarize. So Krista um, was asking that, particularly in recruitment for members of your committee, that we make sure we find a way to connect to early Head Start, or the work of early Head Start because of the significant, fe significant federal investment uh, in the state in early Head Start and the work of that um, program relating to this committee okay yeah okay I got that um, we uh, have in the uh, I can't remember which document but we made a change um, based on comments from the last meeting on referencing that D specifically and we changed that I believe um, to be um, working across the lines with state agencies um, and partners. So that would include early head start in the prenatal to age three and would also include possibly nurse family partnership and other organizations. I think it's not just early head start that we need to be looking at. We need to look at the broad range. And so we change that based on comments. Does that answer or help? Yes, Martha, thank you. That's very helpful. And I, I think the point I was making is uh, perhaps when thinking about membership, it would be helpful to consider both McV, which is not the only um, implementation model for Early Head Start, and it's focused only on home visiting, but there are other models as well. So thinking about how to have a representation in the membership, because the, the, the descriptions of the membership are broad enough that it could recognize the uh, connection. I think it's in the interest of our work to make sure that when we're talking about best beginnings that we're representing um, the investments that are in the state and linking them into this important work. So that's, that's just my request. Okay, I, I mean, I don't, I don't feel that we're leaving anybody out um, if that's the question. No, um, there, there's no I'm question. More inclusive than exclusive. So, um, I'm, if I'm there's I'm... something that needs to be tweaked to make somebody feel better that uh, that I, you know, that we're not doing that on the committee, I'm more than happy to do it. But that's clearly not being done. I, I like a much broader based uh, group. I'm excited that this is transforming from just an HFO committee to a prenatal three. Mm -hmm. So knowing. Mm -hmm. All of that, we we will probably make a few changes in the next little while until we get it right. 
So I think there's, I, the, it, it's Pam, I think there's two levels of conversation happening here. There's the one of a, what we put in the writing, what we put in writing That's right. about what we're looking for, which Martha is speaking to, which is kind of a, a diversity of representation and really taking what was a program committee and expanding it to represent the plethora of activity that needs to happen prenatal to three. And you're asking for, um, at a, at a slightly different level to make sure that we have specific perspectives represented on that committee. Yes, I'm asking, I'm asking in the selection process. And I, I, I want to be on the record as agreeing and supporting the notion of thinking broadly and thinking about how to include folks. I'm just saying, um, I'm asking that in the selection process that there's consideration for specifically Early Head Start um, and Early Head Start Child Care Partnership initiatives that are really <coughs> very completely about integrating and coordinating across different sectors, which is what we're all about. So I think we're all in alignment. I'm just making a specific request. So noted. And as mentioned earlier, the executive committee is going to be spending time when the, um, I think Megan mentioned this earlier, when all of the applications come in to make sure that we have diversity across all of our um, committees and the information that Alyssa is putting together right now about um, who's historically been our commit on our committees and where we've been missing perspectives is going to be fed into that process as well and then we'll bring the entire sort of slate of recommendations back to this group thank you all right are there any other um, items in the committee written reports at this time council members that we need to focus on going twice. All right, thank you very much. So, Rita, can I ask you to join us? And Marlene, have you had a chance to join us on the phone? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are um, uh, council members and uh, Marlene was not able to be with us in person. So Sarita is going to uh, help us uh, with a process of reflecting and looking forward about our equity work to kind of Kali's point earlier about how do we just really keep this momentum going but before we do that Megan? yes so Sarita before you came I shared in my director's report the exciting news about you uh, moving into a vice principal job at the Beaverton School District and taking a really important next step in your career so congratulations again and on behalf of the council we have a recognition for you um, on this plaque and it says uh, in recognition of the trailblazing work mm -hmm. accomplished on behalf of Oregon's underrepresented and most vulnerable mm -hmm. children and families um, this work with the early learning division will have a lasting mm -hmm. impact throughout the state and it's signed from Pam and I but it's from the whole council and from your colleagues at the division we're gonna really miss you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Those I are the really best kinds of things, right? I know. I really appreciate it, and I want you to know that it has been an amazing experience working <coughs> on educational equity policy here at the state level and being able to meet such committed individuals and to collaborate on such a deep level and across the board, across the P20 system. I definitely see myself as a champion for early learning, um, a champion for K-12 education, for higher education, and uh, and I know that we'll continue to work and collaborate together. It's just the beginning, so thank you. I feel I I'm, I feel just so appreciative and grateful to all of you. So, all right. Um, I thought that we, I could just give everybody an update on what we have been doing since March when we approved the the equity report. We literally hit the ground running. About a week after the, uh, the report was approved, we convened an internal early learning division equity team, and uh, we started looking at the recommendations and then prioritizing. So as you know, it's a 30-page document, and it's pretty lofty. The goals are pretty lofty. So we were able to prioritize um, and bring them down, distill them to three major categories. Uh, one being uh, to ensure that we develop a system where we have a diverse and uh, inclusive workforce that includes early learning staff, that includes child care providers across the board, across the early learning system. Um, the second piece was around accurate, consistent, comprehensive, accessible 
data that includes workforce data in addition to child level data. And uh, the third component was around uh, developing, building capacity so that we are all uh, engaging in anti-bias, anti-racist work and initiatives. So part of that is the, is the professional development and, and uh, big, building strong communities of practice. Uh, and then we have uh, the fourth component, which is really ensuring that we have culturally relevant verbal and written communication across the board, that be internally within the ELD, as well as creating a system that sets um, all stakeholders in the early learning system up for success so that we're able to communicate clearly and responsibly to, to um, all, of, all of the individuals that we serve. Uh, and now we're at this point where uh, we're starting to um, assemble sub-teams, so teams for each of those specific areas and then really flesh out the tactics. Um, and so that'll happen this month and next month we'll be able to kick into the implementation mode. Um, and before that, within the month, we'll also have an opportunity for the council to vet our work, vet the work plan, give us feedback input. Um, and we have a couple of other vetting venues to make sure that, we're, that our work is, is comprehensive. In addition to that, uh, Megan had asked me and Pam had asked me to, uh, to have a conversation with all of you about how we can further institutionalize the recommendations, actualize them, operationalize them, um, and thinking ahead in terms of what that would mean for current legislation. And Megan just mentioned um, HB 2060, the ERDC, the hub, and the preschool. Um, plan coming up um, so that's part of the conversation and then the other piece is also to have a discussion around what you feel you need to support to continue to engage in ongoing conversations around equity uh, within within the council um, i have a couple of ideas but i wanted to also uh, start off with what what your thoughts are so what do you think um, <clears throat> I don't know that I have anything particularly profound that I think, but I did want to <laughs> offer up a resource is we now have from two years of data statewide on equity at the early learning level that I think is going to be hugely helpful here. And for example, we can look at parts of the state where we're kicking it in terms of getting expectant African American or Hispanic women into their prenatal visits at the right time with the right supports, with the right, et cetera. And conversely, we can identify, whoa, over here, it's not happening. And we can also take the people who are making it happen and connect them with the people who aren't making it happen and say, you might look at their best practice because it seems to be working and it's exportable. So I think we want to take that data. We're certainly, you know, it's all online right now. You can go into it. it great detail it's but I think we need to use that resource I think you know I support the work we're doing at the end of the day my focus is on moving the needle now for populations of disproportionality and we have some really good tools now to do that and I want to be sure that that's part of our work um, because we have to move the numbers and the the kind of um, other elements that we've identified are absolutely critical. I'd like to be moving the numbers while we're doing everything else we do. I think that's the, that's the challenge I've given to my team um, because we now can do that because we have information and best practice, et cetera. And I think that's our, that's our challenge at the Early Learning Council as well is to actually move the numbers while we're changing the culture, changing the focus, and, and building our capacity in this area. I would pivot off that, and I think part of the key piece of the equity work is um, being strategic and aligning with healthcare. You can track from birth sort of where the disparities begin, and so being very intentional to not only look at that data, but track kids, and really that's when we have access to them, is when they're entering the world. And so how are we, if we're really caring about changing um, the outcomes, then we need to start there. And there are ways to track all along until, you know, 
third grade reading, which is the benchmark that we talk about as being important. So there has to be a lot of intentionality around that. I think there also has to be work on trauma-informed care and understanding the role um, that systemic poverty and systemic racism plays in that. Like there is a role and there's a lot more neuroscience, a lot more behavioral research that talks about that. And I don't see it part of the discourse often in, in conversations. So somehow bringing that to bear. And I would love like if the OEA chief education office is doing research to really produce more research around that so that the public is aware. Um, because it seems like an area where we can also begin to close disparities if more people are cognizant of it. Krista. Can I just piggyback off of that? The other thing that I, I just would, I felt like the experience we had in learning about different kinds of organizations and how um, to be responsive to equity was really helpful um, in just increasing awareness. And so I wonder if that research might become a regular part of increasing our awareness um, in this conversation because I think um, the more we can be aware of both the data and also the neuroscience and the implications around um, trauma and poverty over time and specifically with this proportionality, I think it makes a difference in terms of how we look at our work and what we do. So I, I think that keeping that at the forefront of our conversations and our decision making um, is really an important part. So I don't know how that becomes the structural part of our ongoing work and these meetings. Um, but I think education and awareness um, and reflection, as well as the data-driven um, information that we have, can help us move that needle in a very meaningful way. How would the council like to see that happen or structured? Would you like to have research presented to you through through email, through base camp, through brief introductions or overviews at, at our meetings or during a retreat? I mean, one thing I will offer is, and I think it's really important, is when you send a bunch of stuff off electronically to people, I don't know what the, the correlation is to how many people plow through it all, but people are generally short on time these days overall. So I guess what I would like the council to do is schedule those presentations. So we can have Lori Coiner, and, and part of what we don't want to do is um, all ran, run down <coughs> research trails and duplicate work and not integrate that work because mm -hmm. um, that produces studies as opposed to results. And what we need to do is use research to drive results. So we can have Lori Coiner from the Office of Equ Health uh, Analytics come, um, joined by Leanne Johnson, who runs our equity and inclusion program. They can take this council through every county in the state. Here's what it looks like. Here's the incidence and prevalence of poverty. Here's the growth rate in incidence and prevalence of poverty. Here's the fact that a quarter of the people in Oregon are now on Medicaid. We are happy to come and do that in a very organized way with, you know, we probably, to do respect to that work, it's probably a two-hour presentation. But mm -hmm. we're happy to work <coughs> with you and get that schedule. It has to be after um, September because we're, slam till then but after then we'd be happy to do it so I saw lots of heads nodding too yeah. we need to have it in the group the other thing that I, I would add that it does besides the short of time it, is it gives us the opportunity as a council to create some of our own culture around how we view these things as a group which then lays the foundation for what we do going forward so I think that's another value in doing it as a conversation. Terry. I just think back on the presentation we had around epigenetics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, how as a um, as a council I think there were there were some light bulbs that went on and some real aha moments for us all about um, the three to three is might be way downstream and we really need to look at where we are preconception prenatally you know I mean, we need to push our work way upstream. We need to work on those babies that are being more now to make sure they're good parents many years later. I mean, we really, and we're not there yet. But I think that just thinking back on how this group took that information, really discussed it, uh, I think that's the, the, the model that I would like to see Great. for that Great. work. Thank you. Council members, others? <clears throat> Krista? Just follow up. 
I agree about having the presentations here, and I also think having something about equity every single time that we meet is really important. Um, and it also sets a stage in terms of moving um, this forward uh, in our state so that leaders and other groups, whether it be early learning hub meetings or other folks that are meeting, can follow a lead that's set by this council. Lee. I'd also, I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm still a pretty newbie on the council, but when I first started, there was some forum that happened where families came and I think it was here in Salem. It was. We kind of forego that during the legislative session because yeah, things are a little wacky. Yeah, but I felt that was so helpful uh -huh. to understanding reality. And so I really want to incorporate hearing from families, hearing from diverse communities, understanding what their realities are. And I realize it's different geographically, too. Yes. So what is affecting someone, you know, across the state in eastern Oregon is different than the metro area. But all of those voices really matter, and it's helpful to me to see outside of my zone and hear outside of my zone. I think there's a tendency for us to project what we think folks need and not listen enough to what they they actually need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I, that's very helpful. And uh, just so council members know, um, we plan to resume that uh, in our July, excuse me, <clears throat> in our July meeting following the signing day of the legislature. So we typically, for new council members during the legislative session, meet here for reasons like some of us have to go across the street and come back, and um, but then uh, we'll, we'll resume our road show around the state, well, which includes that. to bring their early learners, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Filming <clears throat> all the babies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Council members, additional um, reflections or thoughts? Thank you for the work. Yeah, I would just put one other, as we do the re a resource, um, I would just offer one resource with my day job hat on. <clears throat> Um, with thanks to Rob and others and Lynn, uh, others around the table. So my organization is in the process of analyzing um, ten, uh, 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 data from 10 birth years from 2000 to th 2010. We've matched vital statistics and birth records, which includes some prenatal information, um, to human services and Medicaid records, which includes behavioral health um, for their ch for all children born 2000 to 2010 and their families. <coughs> Rob is helping us access education data, and then we're adding juvenile justice data. So for children born in those years, uh, by the end of the summer, we will have been able to track paths that they take associated with which sorts of predictive factors and I think that kind of information will be really useful particularly coupled with the service information that Lynn would be able to bring so we'd be happy to bring that data to the table to the council when when it is available and ready we have peaks at it now we just don't have the education and juvenile justice data in but um, I'd be happy to talk with any of you about it offline that's great so. and that should inform what happens what comes out of the legislature <coughs> and sort of enacting the things that we have like I feel like that data is important to understand how we implement there's a lot of uh, just the peaks that the, I mean the piece that we do the pieces that we do have which includes human services and Medicaid um, are is pretty astounding uh, in terms of which kind of risk factors or which kind of predictive factors pop people in which programs just within human services so yes all right additional um, feedback for Sarita or reflections from last time going forward, Kali? Can I say one more thing? Of course you can. <laughs> can we invite K-12 folks to some of these conversations? Like, I I feel like these conversations happen so separately, and maybe because I work my day job in the K-12 sphere, like, this is so important. Everything you're saying, K-12 needs to know. I don't know that how exposed, Rob, you would know better than I, but I feel like there is still a disconnect there, and so, if they can just be invited, I don't know if they'll show up, but leaders um, in the K-12 system, beyond just the superintendents. Let's have them present on a few occasions <laughs> about how they're integrating with their hubs. That would be great, too. Just Absolutely. To, yeah, like something. Yeah. Well, Here you are. Especially when we, if we, I'm going to go ahead and say at our November meeting, um, we could do the health presentation, and there's no reason that we couldn't invite what, I'm not, I don't remember what community we plan to be in in November, but the K-12 people from that community in to get the information and kind of publicize it as a right. something that people need to hear. Yeah. Great. All right. Anything else, Councilmember? I, I was just yeah. I think that you, I think that um, Kelly's right. You know, there's and there's a variety of how that looks. Um, you go to Gladstone, you're going to see one thing, right? Or David Douglas, for example, and then other places. 
you're going to not see anything. And so getting that right, I think some of the work that um, we've started around just aligning the standards uh, is really important, and we hope to have that work done by, what, December, January? To our boards in January. Right, which yeah. will, I think, gives us an opportunity to think about this in a different way and then actually have something to present to people that um, will be of value across the system, and it, just in a sort of a really tangible way. There's lots of value across the system. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It just is that here's something that you can have in your hand and hang on to and, and um, begin to work toward. We can invite Sarita back yes. right at the end. There you go. <laughs> now you are our ambassador into the okay. world of P12. <laughs> Sounds good. This elementary and, school and, vice president. And back the other way, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, to summarize, I heard that it's important for us to use data structures and systems that are currently in place and build off of that, that wisdom and that foundation. I heard that it's important for us to have consistent um, opportunities to look at research and um, specifically research that drives results and allows us to achieve our ultimate goals and outcomes. Uh, and I really, and I heard that there needs to be a combination of um, engaging internally um, in, conversa in depth conversations around equity, but also ensuring that we're community informed and creating opportunities for community to come in and speak to us about their areas of expertise um, so that it's a two-way street. And specifically calling out the connection or the need for there to be a stronger connection with the K-12 K system. And I'll be happy to send that information on to the equity, ELD equity team, and I'd be happy to continue to be a bridge for that, for those efforts as well. Thank you so much, and thank you for this as well. Oh, thank you for everything. Hopefully we'll see you, continue to see oh, you. Oh, yes. Marlene, is there anything that you want to add to this conversation? Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to stay on this other thing for a second now that you know, you know you might open it up in the room. So um, I do think that when there is a presentation about data that um, you know that would be really meaningful to a broader audience, and I think that lots of it is. And certainly, um, I think Terry talked about a presentation that uh, really impacted my thinking about a number of things. But when there is that kind of thing, I think it would be great if we could invite um, through the Confederation of Oregon School Administrators. Mm -hmm. There's a group that's called the Superintendent's mm -hmm. Vision and Policy um, Group. It's a group of about 20 superintendents in the state that um, comes together on a regular basis and they sort of have been, from K-12, I think that they've been a significant driving factor in some of the changes that we see taking place in K-12 in the state. and. Um, I think they pushed really hard on things like the creation of OEIB um, in its original form and, and uh, even the, the, all of the different changes that happened at the legislature in 2011 um, that set some of what we currently have uh, in place in motion and that it's a group when they coalesce around an idea um, can be really powerful. Uh, it's, but it's important to have them understand things in a really deep way and, and coalesce around something. And some of the presentations that they could see and understand here, um, I think, could really drive uh, the network or the idea of making sure that we have continuity between early learning and K-12 in a way that we've never had before. That's a group that can really help make it happen. And they just need to understand the entry point and how it all fits together and what actions they can take to support the work so that they, so that we're able to move out <coughs> with kids in a really different way. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> Council members, anything else on this topic before we move on? Okay. So before we move to the next item, I just want to welcome Aaron Kelly Seal. Thank you. Um, so uh, Martha, we have two council members on the phone, Martha Brooks and Marlene Yesquin. And um, Martha and um, Marlene, Erin Kelly-Seal, who's the director of the Department of Human Services um, here 
in Oregon has joined us and Aaron will be joining us uh, at future meetings going forward as an ex officio member of the council. So um, this is a piece of uh, feedback we heard from you, uh, gosh, more than a year ago and we've been chipping away at sort of how we could structure this. So um, you now council members have uh, by virtue of participation appointed or ex officio the heads of the major departments with which early learning interacts. Lynn um, as the Health Authority Director, Aaron as the Department of Human Services Director, and Rob's replacement um, as the uh, Department of Education. So um, we are continuing our organizational work to get what we need for the conversation to continue to move forward. So thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate having you here. Welcome. Okay. <clears throat> Um, council members, we're going to do one more and then we're going to take a break. So the next item on our agenda is the rules, process, and principles discussion. Um, a couple of things leading up to this uh, contextual uh, piece and then I want to turn it over to Bobby. We have a few more uh, recognitions to do. So, <clears throat> excuse me, our, uh, just as a reminder to council members, we established a rules committee so that we would have a consistent place for the various rulemaking uh, responsibilities of this group uh, to, to rest. And because our rulemaking charges come from previously existing places and multiple previously existing places, there hasn't been any sort of consistent application um, and we've just been kind of responding to them in a one-off <clears throat> that re everything from child care licensing to medical marijuana to a program oversight of Healthy Families Oregon so and everything in between. So um, we've been working on a consistent process and framework for rules tied to our early learning goals. Bobby's going to go through that. What we decided is that for better or for worse, and many thanks to everybody who serves on that committee. It's a blended committee of members of this uh, council as well as community members, and they double as our child care um, and early education committee as well. So they, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, are doing double duty. So to that end, we have a couple of members of that committee who are uh, retiring and moving on. So this is bittersweet, uh, a theme for today. Yeah, so three committee. members of um, the Child Care and Education Committee actually moved from being members of the Commission for Child Care into being members of our committee to ensure a smooth transition from the Commission's work to the Council's work. And um, so they have served a long time they never miss a meeting uh, Harley they are amazing advocates for young children and so we are going to recognize the three of them and I'll just briefly Deborah Murray uh, was the director of Peninsula built up Peninsula as an amazing uh, advocate for young children and their families Peninsula Child Care Center and um, and has provided such depth to both the work of the commission and now us, and so it's with real regret that it's time to say uh, th that uh, Deborah is moving on and making room for new people to join the committee. So right behind is Randy Fishfader, who um, has educated so many early childhood uh, professionals in the state. She was on faculty at. Um, Chemeketa Community College, but her reach was far, far broader than that, and she's a genius with um, how to how, how to adult how to teach adults to behave with very young children, and she has a depth of knowledge and wisdom, and we have benefited greatly from that. So we're sad to say um, next steps with Randy, and then Russ actually comes as a team. Russ and Ruth Cromer actually <laughs> are uh, the working um, team. And when Russ and Ruth started with the commission, they had a family child care home. And now as they're moving off, they own multiple centers mm -hmm. in Bend. Is that correct? I think so. But anyway, they are at least one or two um, centers and have brought 
a very on the ground, real understanding of what child care and education is like in Oregon, and we have benefited greatly from their hard work. So, so it's bittersweet, but um, that ties in with our new nomination process, and we're um, hoping to uh, find um, people to take, they won't take their place, but to mm -hmm. uh, um, create the, their own new role on the, in the committee. So now it's, um, the action we're going to ask of you is to adopt a framework. You're, this is to get you ready. There is more work coming. This is really to get your input on the process, the framework that we have envisioned. And I just want to do a little short history. About a year ago, uh, Pam said at a meeting, so let's have the Child Care and Education Committee act as rule, uh, c the Rule Advisory Committee. And I sat there and said, okay, I had no <laughs> idea what that meant. Um, mm -hmm. And it did take time to figure out because, um, and so we, uh, the the staff that have done rules in um, Oregon for early learning and um, the council have had to figure it out together. But I think it's important to know that in almost every state, rulemaking is done by staff in agencies. So to have this strong policy role is an innovation. And um, we, anyway, so I'll talk more about that. But um, Megan said at one point um, something to the effect that rules are the way you embody policy. And that kind of opened the door for me and got us um, thinking differently and um, <coughs> about what, the big question was, um, it takes a lot of legal expertise and detail, knowledge, to write rules. That's a very, it's a regulatory process. It's very, very legalistic. And um, so it was, what is the policy role? That was what, has, what we have put so much energy into. And here's what we're bringing forward to you. Um, that we are, will adopt um, a uh, set a vision and framework that will guide all rulemaking by this council and that it will start with our three goals children ready for school um, families stable and attached and systems that are coordinated and integrated and so with those three goals we will then follow with a set of principles and the then the role of the committee will to be to go in detail through every set of rules that the staff um, works on and measure the extent to which it is aligns with the principles. And then when that is done, it comes to the council with our recommendation based on that alignment process. So we're not, this group is not becoming a group of regulator regulatory experts. What we are doing is providing the guidance and the oversight. So we are getting technical assistance. We are the first state that the, that the national expert has been able to find that is doing this. Um, but I don't think we'll be the last. It makes so much sense. And the other thing that I think is really important is that we have um, so many different rules, uh, kinds of rules. And people tend to think of the child care and education facility rules. That's only one of our sets of rules. We also have all the rules that govern the contracts we make with people who deliver services directly to children. So all of those are in there too. And we also have some, uh, uh, tax credits and they have rules so there's there's different cl we're calling them clusters but um, so what we will be bringing to you is um, 
a, this set of principles. And I think you are going to be very, want to be very engaged in these, they are extremely important statements. They are radically different than the practice in the past, so we have to be very purposeful. Do we, is this what we want to do? So the, where we are right now is um, working with the national expert and with the committee in an iterative process, we're getting advice from at least three, probably four other states who haven't done what we've done, but have been concerned about getting more voices involved, and so to learn from them. And so we, but we're on a pretty rapid timeline because we have a set of rules waiting um, that need revision. And depending what the legislature does, we may be promulgating new rules and under pressure to get those done. So we will be moving very quickly. So what the action today is to get your feedback on this process. And if you see places we should tweak it or um, whatever, so you're ready uh, at the, I think at the next meeting we get to actually um, dig into the principles and maybe can start a process with you even before that. So, so and council members, just to put a, uh, one finer point on something that Bobby said, <clears throat> your executive committee made an explicit choice to hold up rules that were coming your way to say we're going to operate with existing rules until we get this framework in place rather than having to go back and sort of redo. So that's an explicit decision on the part of your executive committee and I just wanted to make that clear that that had happened. So let's open it up for conversation, Eva. Um, thanks. I, I, I like that we'll have some sort of like clear path on how to make rules. Can we get something that will show not only the you know the guiding principles, but how they line up with public input and uh, you know like public testimony, things like that. You know like what does what does that process look like? Um, so that people can be engaged and that we're encouraging people to be engaged on the rulemaking process. You want the principles as well as the process articulated. Yes. Got it. See them together. Yeah. Thank you. Charles. I would also love to see sort of how the rules impact um, the equity plan and how it sort of falls and connects into all that. There may be, to that point, there may be princi crossover principles, and that may be a, a there, point of I, guidance that we the, want to give the There's uh, several uh, equity principles in the draft that we're working on now. Okay. Krista. I'm still learning about rules, um, but I'm just curious about if rules are how uh, we're implementing policy on the ground, are there time frames that will be attached to this that will be considered of in terms of how it imp impacts or affects implementation? Like, for instance, if there's a change that needs to be made, but it is going through all these clearly very intentional processes, um, do we want to be thoughtful about how much time we would allow before there could actually be the impacted change that needs to happen? And, or, or, the, or reverse, if it takes too long, are there unintended consequences around that? You know, in the rulemaking, is it in there that, already? they actually put dates. Mm -hmm. But do so you remember in, in the marijuana yes. rules, the rules themselves take, I mean, that's a, that'll be something we have to think about in the, that we, in the principles about how we talk about that, but you embed that in the rules itself to do just what you're talking about. So does the extra step of getting work through at the committee level, does it have impact on that, on the overall time? I mean, are we anticipating that we'll take additional time to... So let, let me try to answer it at a high level and then maybe Megan can come. So I, I think, Krista, what we're trying to do actually <clears throat> is it's not an additional step, it is the rulemaking step. So in most cases, and historically even here in Oregon, <clears throat> excuse me, rules have been promulgated and the process has been directed by staff. We're now opening that up to say that it's because of its important connection to policy. Right. This is a replacement. This is not an add-on for the process. I see. And there are guidelines about 
how much time and how much notice to your point about public input need to be given and then so those will be built into the process um, and we won't be able to change those because those are existing statewide for across all of the rules mm -hmm. um, so this is really an attempt to do what we've been saying that we've wanted to do since our existence which is to just really open crack this open make things more accessible to including to the people who are receiving services and who may be disenfranchised by the system so we can do a better job as well Thank you. That's helpful clarification. That's exactly right. I think the thing that is making it feel like we're slowing down right now, when we are <clears throat> slowing down, is the work that we're doing to create the, the policy framework and the principles for rulemaking to use as the filter. I that see. is causing a couple sets of rules that do really need revision to be on pause right now. But we realized that if we didn't do that, then we would never actually get to where we wanted to go and we would be sort of constantly trapped in this state of urgency and never actually do the work to establish that framework. So it's a little bit painful right now with a couple rule sets that we're waiting on. Um, but I think the short term pain is worth how much more clear everything else will be going forward. So from an agency land perspective, we do feel some pain. Um, and it's worth it because things are going to be so much more clear and organized around how we're making decisions in regulation. And go it's slow more to go efficient, fast. if yeah. I'm hearing you say. Exactly. Go slow to go fast yeah. and ultimately a more efficient and integrated and involved process. That's yep. right. Exactly. Thank you. That's a good clarification. Appreciate it. <laughs> Questions or additional comments, council members, about this process? I have a process question. I'm wondering how we're going to get input from, I've brought up the family, friends, and neighbor group. I'm wondering how they're going to be engaged. They're definitely impacted by the rules that we'll be dealing with. And I know that they have opinions, but I don't know, given their workload and their work schedules, I just, I, wanna, I want their input. Mm -hmm. on the rules and I'm not quite sure which process is the best process to ensure that we get it. I don't know that they would show up for testimony per se, but I, so how do we, how can we be intentional in making sure that that group is... It sounds like Lynn wants to respond to I think, <laughs> well, I have a great idea. I think that um, all the research is showing now that, um, and, and it's our biggest tool and it's free and it's pervasive. So I think we could have a rules blog. And everyone can be on there. They can read. They can and and the the incidence and prevalence of technology is now pervasive. I mean, at all socioeconomic income levels, it is per, it's amazing. I mean, I, it just opens up this huge door that we've never had before. So if we had a blog where we could put up stuff and share stuff and and I don't know how to make a blog, but I know someone <laughs> in the state knows how to make a blog. But, but that's a universally accessible tool in modern culture. And moving to that kind of approach, as a, which is also a green approach, as opposed to the kind of historical, we schedule, we do this, we do that, would be really, I think, helpful to everyone and is apparently the most universal way to access people if if you like. Now, not everyone, not everyone has the technology, but the libraries all do. And they operate on a family schedule, but, but also the research is showing now that many, 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 fa the one thing that we're finding um, in the population of poverty is a smartphone at all levels. It is amazing. We have families that we work with that are in their cars and they have a smartphone. They have no house, they have no housing, but they have their smartphone. So I think using something like that would be cool and fun. So, uh, yeah, um, it, the, the process even bef it, where you want engagement is in the early, not at the not public here. hearing. Uh, I mean, that's important, but really so much of the work has been done. And so um, the principles you'll see, the draft we have right now includes quite a bit on engagement of um, anybody affected, and we pulled out parents as a separate one. And um, because they're so affected by the rules, even though they don't know that, <laughs> they are. And so the that um, the state has used some kind of electronic site to get input, and I think we can just keep, you know, amp 
amping it up until it's really an effective way and that we publicize. But that's another advantage of the council being involved is you'll know that we are starting to look at a specific set of rules and can encourage people to participate in the st stage. But that's, a, that's one of the principles, two of, I think of the principles. The, the, what they're learning about blogs that I think is different, and, and I'm not expert on this at all, but what they're learning is that because it's more of a community voice and a community conversation that pe sometimes people do say things they shouldn't say on a blog, That's we know that, but also we know that people will say things that they would not be comfortable saying in public, right? Because they might be intimidated, they might ask, so people will ask questions on blogs that they wouldn't ask in other settings. They will. They will go out with their opinions in ways they wouldn't go out in other settings. So I think, I just think it's, it, it's, it's different than a website. It doesn't act like a website. It's not as intimidating as a website. And it may be a, a useful format to, for engagement for Thank the population. Thank you. We can certainly explore that. Eva. Oh, I was going to say uh, that Stacy Cowan, who's on the, uh, the, the committee, it, it represents family, friend, and neighbor providers through SEIU. Um, and then mm -hmm. we also, I, I, I just was whispering to Aaron that, hey, can we find some way to communicate with the FFN providers that are in the DHS system for employment related daycare, um, you know, to get, you know, to solicit input, you know, or maybe send out some sort of communication. Um, is I, you know, going through the, the, the other, the other reports later on. Uh, that was one of the comments that jumped out to me. It was like, we don't know who FFN are, but we have an idea, and we know we we can reach them. But I do I do appreciate that you were pointing it out. Same with family child care. You know, they they the licensed family child care. They you know it's difficult for them to get away. But so how can we find ways for them to? So I like the blog idea. It won't work for everyone, but it'll get more. Yeah. Council members, any? Oh, excuse me, Terry. I'm sorry. I just. Um, to that, I uh, think we need to be culturally responsible in the way we put the language out about the rule changes. Because if we post the rules and say, this is the rule and this is what it's going to look like, you know, we don't even want to read that. <laughs> so um, we're going to have to really be intentional about, about the language mm -hmm. that we use to explain what's there and what the change is and make sure that, you know, the common citizen, the family, friend, and neighbor, child care provider, the parent can understand what we're talking about. It's a great, that's a great point, and it's a great example of how when we actually start to roll up our sleeves and do what we say we want to do, it, it calls on us all to do it in a much different way than maybe we thought about when we said we wanted to do it. So I think that's a great point. Other um, thoughts about the process here, council members, or any, in particular, any concerns, any objection? <clears throat> Good work. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we will take that as a yay, and we're going to move forward. And council members, you can anticipate you. at your July meeting having the principles aligned to those three goals that we focus on in front of you. And then shortly thereafter, we'll have a framework to start ticking the rules through. All right? So um, with that, we're going to take a bit of a break. During the break, I'm going to pass the gavel to Charles. I'm going to run across the street, and then um, I will be back, um, and we'll continue on. So, Martha, are you still on the line? I am. Okay. Apologies. We're coming to you next, um, and we're going to take about a 10-minute break in the room. We're going to put the phone on mute so you all don't hear our craziness, and or maybe you do want to hear it. I don't know. Um, and then uh, we'll be back with you, but you're up next. All right. Thanks, everyone. We're recessed. For some of the stuff in the libraries. Okay. All right. So next on our agenda is Martha. All right. Martha. Hi, everybody. Um, and I'm speaking to you from beautiful downtown Missoula, Montana, and. It's um, gorgeous here, so glad to be with you. Um, our last meeting, we brought uh, forward the proposal for the prenatal age three subcommittee, and there was some input which we went back and we had a very good staff member, Aaron Dean, who worked on this in collaboration with 
Megan and I to make sure that we got all of the comments and changes put together. I think the biggest one uh, or question mark was the name, and we settled on what's called Best Beginnings Prenatal to Age 3 Subcommittee and Healthy Families Oregon Advisory Committee. So the, the short process on this is that we will just call it Best Beginnings. Um, we did a search. There isn't anything like that in Oregon, and um, we liked what that name conveyed. Um, tried that out with some of the committee members, and they liked it. So hopefully you all are good with that name now. Yep. We also went through and made a few other changes. One I mentioned earlier already, which was coordination with, instead of the <clears throat> pulling that out, and set other state and federal agencies for collaborative partnerships uh, for present and future opportunities. Uh, we addressed some of the culturally, or not some of, all of the culturally specific language taken out of our RFP proposal, uh, that same language and inserting it, that went through uh, legal counsel, so we feel very good about using that particular verbiage. Um, added the emerging practices and research as requested, and um, then just cleaning up some of the general language that was um, was discussed. And that was in the particular um, document called the charge. And then we went to some governing rules and just basically went through and made those changes to add best beginnings rather than prenatal to age three. Um, and then again did some uh, word editing or smithing per se on uh, committee members recruiting to apply for membership. Uh, with the change on the application process, we had an application process which was very close to what was presented today. And instead of having two different documents and having to come back later, we've already inserted that change into the uh, governing rules. And other than that, I think we've really answered the questions and we're ready to go. As Megan said and, and Pam, that we need to get organized to do the work. Uh, healthy Families has been languishing for four, about four years, and it's nice to be able to take the committee now that we have the RFP process uh, wrapping up for July 1, which will actually go in effect probably October 1 starting over brand new with new committee with a new charge um, it's just really exciting and we're we're ready to hit the ground running so that's my report unless there are any questions oh i do have one other thing in that we are uh, doing our outreach now for committee members and we do have a list that started so if any of you have community members that you want um, us to reach out to you can send those to myself or Megan or Aaron, and we'll be more than happy to collate those on the list as well as once we get that application up online uh, that we've approved today, that they can go online and actually do the application. And looking for a lot of community members. I've told staff already that I want a cross section from across the state and not just from um, the Valley. And that's it. I believe we have to approve the name change. Uh, no, we don't. Okay. No, I mean that. This is why we we're going to have a handbook to clarify parliamentary procedures for the <laughs> council. But it's just the what we want to call the committee, and it's not so formal. It needs a approval, I don't think. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so on to Don and Heidi. Yeah, come on up. Come. So I'm going to do a little bit of framing for you as a council as to what you're going to, why Don and Heidi are here and what you're going to be hearing over the course of this presentation. So um, I think everybody knows in our state we have a network of what's called child care resource and referral agencies. Um, and they are charged with a lot of really important work. Number one, um, providing support and training to child care providers, um, both formal and informal um, child care providers who receive subsidy. So that's one important function that CCRNR performs for us. They also do referrals for parents to child care and in particular have focused on doing enhanced referrals for especially vulnerable families who need to connect with child care and kind of doing 
some hand holding and some extra support to help them find care. And then they also collect a lot of data that goes to researchers like Bobby um, to, uh, to do the market rate study for the state of Oregon, which is required by CCDF, correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's the function that child care resource and referral plays. And by statute, early learning division staff are actually required to provide this council with an update on the child care resource and referral system twice a year. Well, you haven't had one since April 2013. So um, it's time for us to do an update for you on child care resource and referral. And if you remember, this was actually the month before I started working for the division, but I was at this meeting. And I don't know if you remember, Carol Waddell presented to you the outcome of an RFP process that the office, the child care division at that time had just gone through. And we switched central coordination to WU, and we uh, rebid who the agencies around the state were. Um, and you will be doing that again in about a year, because those are five-year bids um, that we do. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff changing in April 2013 um, at the, la the last time that you heard a report. And then since then, a lot's changed in our system. We have early learning hubs. We have CCOs that are maturing. We have an equity lens that we've adopted. We have a quality rating improvement system. We have major changes coming down the pike um, from the feds around child care policy. There's just a lot in flux. And so um, last year, late last year, I think it was November, or so, mm -hmm. I asked mm -hmm. early learning division staff um, to convene a couple of groups, a couple of work groups, to get some public input on how well <coughs> our current system was meeting the needs of child care providers and early learning professionals um, and the needs of parents around um, referral and access to services. And just kind of looking at, you know, within the context of our system, which has changed a lot, how is our current approach to those two things? meeting the need or not meeting the need, and if we were going to change it or if we were going to imagine what the ideal, set, the ideal set of services would look like in that way, what would, what would we imagine, what would we dream up? And then from that sort of blue sky thinking, what can we actually do within existing resources, money, time, people? And so um, Don and Heidi are going to present to you a little bit of an update on the existing child care resource and referral network so that we're fulfilling our statutory requirements. But then they're going to talk to you about what we learned from these two groups that we convened. And we, it all told was like 40 people across the two groups, um, child care providers, parents. We really tried to make it the real people in the system, not just the staff of the division talking about what we think. And what we, what we charged them with was to think with us about what the ideal supports for child care providers would look like and what the ideal system of referral for parents would look like. Um, and so what we're bringing forward to, to you today is the best thinking of those two groups, the best thinking of early learning division staff who worked with those groups. And what we need from you now is to give us your best thinking um, based on those recommendations so that we can really finalize what direction we want to go in um, as we're renewing contracts with child care resource and referral and then also gearing up, we know, to do a, a competitive bid of that system um, in 2016. So this is a real, this is a point for you guys to weigh in and give feedback on what community members have told us they need and further push and refine our thinking before we spring into action. That's the point of today. Does that make sense? It does. Great. So with that, I'm going to, I also want to just, she'll introduce herself in a moment, but I want to recognize Megan, and I don't know your last name. Gorecki. Gorecki? Megan Gorecki, who is a parent um, of children at Earl Boyles Elementary School, who participated as one of a handful of parents who were part of this process. And she's here to give us her perspective. And I can't wait to hear from you. I want to say thank you for making the drive to Salem. Thank you for the engagement that you had in the work groups themselves and for being a voice for, for yourself, for your kids, and for other parents. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed it. With that, I will hand it to you guys. Thank Great. you. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm Heidi McGowan. I know most of you. It's really a pleasure to see you. It's been a little while. I had the privilege of facilitating these work groups and the process and working closely with Megan and with Don. And really appreciate you, Megan, joining us today. We're very fortunate to have one of, one of the work group representatives with us. Uh, they, they put a lot of time in. We had a really great group. Um, 
So with that, Megan's already teed up our conversation. We're, we're going to kick off and let Don share, first of all, just a brief update about the, the CCR in our system, kind of some nuts and bolts, and then we're going to turn to the recommendations, and we'll talk about sort of the process that we took and, and some of the work we did, and then dive into the recommendations. And then hear from Megan, really, how you view the, what you see the heart of the, the recommendations are really saying. So, all right, Don. Great. Well, in your packet, I think it'd be behind tab four, if I'm keeping track yeah. of the tabs right, mm -hmm. um, is we kind of mm -hmm. outlined a one-pager that really kind of talks about some data points and where the funding and how resources are allocated towards CCR and our services. Um, and so when we think, I think it's important to note that we have sh a shared contract between the Early Learning Division and Department of Human Services or CCR in our services. Um, and so this um, chart is really meant to kind of outline the core work that happens based on that shared contract. Um, I think some important kind of points when we think about this, this is all funded by child care development funds, which you had an overview with in January. Um, and just kind of as a point of context is that with the CCDF funds that DHS has, they they use about 2% of those to fund CCR and our services. Um, additionally, the Early Learning Division uses about 5% of their total CCDF funds to fund CCR and our services in our state. So just to kind of give a little context in terms of the funding allocation um, within that stream. I think also is important to note is the number of, an and these are annual numbers, not by the biennium, um, of the number of people who attend trainings through the CCR in our system um, and kind of how that funding is associated with that. Um, we also know that about 17% of all of these trainings have been delivered in a language other than English. Um, additionally, about 26% of all the participants um, are from a, a traditionally underrepresented population. So just to kind of give you who they're reaching, who, who they're not, the, kind of the How scope of that. that so we used our workforce data and so we looked I essentially I mean I have specific figures but it's essentially any other race or ethnicity other than white is where I came up with that um, figure speaking and the not and non-english speaking and right now our data still working on getting it cleaned up that's of what we have reported so that's kind of a, a, a gross number I would say okay and do you count SC like low income in that Category as well, low-income individuals or no? Is it just based on race um, Not, not in that number that I gave you. Okay. I think there's ways to look at that, but but not in those numbers. Is it disaggregated at all by race? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, is that something, Megan? We could get. Yeah, okay. Um, any follow-up that you guys want, or any data points you want as follow-up, we'll just keep track of a list to send out. Um. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, just a question about why the split in use between the early learning system and the Department of Human Services. Um, why why not, why aren't the funds just um, overseen by one uh, division? I mean, I think historically over time that that's how they used to be separate contracts like through the interagency agreement that went to DHS around the subsidy, the funding to support license exempt providers receiving subsidy. Um, that's where that funding came. And as we started coming more together as a system, we really started creating a shared contract because so much of the work blends together. Um, I know. Bobby, Aaron, I'd definitely welcome others to. I can chime in, and okay. Aaron, you yeah. can too if you want. But Marlene, this is Megan. Um, just by way of reference point, the Early Learning Division contracts with the Department of Human Services for the administration of our child care subsidy program. At the, it's a little more complicated than that, but just to make it as simple as possible for the purposes of this discussion. And then part some of the funds that we send from our federal block grant to DHS for the administration of that program we also send um, funding to them to do uh, required trainings with license exempt providers who receive subsidy. And then what Donna's is saying is that uh, up until, I guess, the last contract period, these were totally separate contracts. Never did we have a shared conversation. Where we're at today is a joint contract. 
and then that I think it's a it's a good question that you just asked, but one that Aaron and I haven't had the chance to really talk about um, in any depth together around um, does it make sense to look at keeping more of the funds at the ELD and doing direct contracts with with CCRNR? Do we like the joint contracts? We really haven't had the chance to engage or unpack that, but it's a good question. Um, the joint contract was a step from moving from totally separate to doing the work together and, and sharing the responsibility. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding correctly. My, my, the way that I understand it is that the funds go for child, they, they're all for child development, right, child care. So it seemed like the, the use of the funds would be um, reused for the same purpose. So I didn't see why, I didn't really understand why the separation. Right. I think the historic That's justification for it, this is Erin Marlene, is that in the past, and I'm not sure this is where we are today, but the department has had to purchase things separately in order to ensure that our consumers are availed access. And so while the charge for the child care division was all parents in the state of Oregon, we have a charge specifically around traditionally underrepresented families and families that are a little bit harder to reach. And so historically, and we have a lot of places where this is true in DHS, we have purchased um, things from other agencies or or specifically carved out dollars in funding that otherwise is, you know, in our bucket to ensure that the parents that we serve through our <coughs> programs or the families or the children are getting access to that larger service. And it's, it's not always been true that if we do not make that intentional step and that intentional purpose that that actually happens. And I think on that, really, when you look at kind of what the referral piece looks like, is it really speaks to that, the, the legs on the ground, the helping the families connect to the care of the families that traditionally don't have the, the same social networks that other families have and need some extra support to really walk through. Um, in just doing some, you know, overarching work, it was really looking at, I mean, it can take up to an hour with a family to really kind of lay the foundation to really get them access to the child care and the services that they need. Um, so I, I think, I mean, unless there's other questions around kind of this document, that's kind of the state of where we're at, how where kind of the points of what the referrals look like on an annual basis, what the trainings and how kind of the funding is allocated. Um, I think w if there's no further questions, we're ready to kind of dive into the recommendations from the work groups. Okay. Well, so, okay. I have one other question. So, I'm trying to understand how different populations use CCNR. So that's the sort of basis of the questions. When you talk about 26% underrepresented individuals using the system, how are they using the system? Are they using the referral system? Are they using the training? Like, what pieces of the system are they using? No, thank you. For I wasn't clear. When the the twenty six percent was really specific about the training data, the training. so that we know, because okay. that's where we have really our best data point okay. in terms of the workforce. So we know that twenty six percent of the people who have attended all of these trainings here were from an underrepresented population. Yeah. Great. Yep. All right, so you have in front of you a report called Parent Referral and Enrollment Services and Provider Support and Professional Development Work Groups. So as Megan mentioned, we uh, Megan sponsored two work groups in the fall that came together, <coughs> one with a focus really specifically on parent referrals and enrollment services, really looking at how do we ensure that families are able to find and then get enrolled into services that they may want or, or may need. And then we had the other work group, the Provider Support and Professional Development Work Group, really come together to look at, as we think about our professional development system in Oregon, how do we, um, how do we ensure it's meeting the needs of our diverse early learning workforce and that we really are creating one of the, the best PD systems that we could have in the country. So we, we brought both of these work groups together and as you look at the report on page one, I just want to acknowledge and, and highlight the, the participants who are part of the work groups. Uh, they really invested significant time and contribution that was very, very valuable and meaningful. They um, came together to meet twice a month over a period of four months 
And then they even took time themselves to go back to their own constituent groups, whether it's parents, mm -hmm. providers, or other colleagues, um, to obtain their input and feedback in the emerging developing recommendations. So a little bit about the process that we took is that each, each work group began by establishing a set of guiding principles, guiding principles that would guide our recommendations and our, and our work together. And then we worked through a series of guiding questions, starting with what would an ideal system look like, what would be possible, and then really examining what we don't have. And that started developing emerging themes that we could start um, massaging into recommendations. So for example, we asked the professional development system work group, um, what, would, what would you want in order to support providers to serve children and families so that children are prepared for kindergarten across our diverse settings? And then for the parent referral work groups, in an ideal world, um, as a parent, how and where would, would you find, or I find as a parent, referral and enrollment services? And then we went through and had really a series of rich discussions. Um, we also really prioritized and worked to ground our recommendations in the equity lens and the equity lens principles. And each work group received an engaging session with Helen Visaragra, sort of a training and an engaging session. And then we, we used the equity lens questions while developing the recommendations, and we continue to come back to them um, at every meeting. Um, so <clears throat> the work resulted in the enclosed recommendations, and Don's going to walk us through those recommendations and the strategies, and then we'll, we'll get to hear from Megan as well. <laughs> Great. Right. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. So as you, you know, start looking through the document, the first few pages are really, one through five is the, the process that Heidi described. When you get into um, page six, where you really start listing the guiding principles that the group established, and really how the recommendations really fell out were in terms of kind of a, a state level system driver, and as well as and then a service delivery driver. And so from that, the group really identified both short-term and long-term outcomes that really, I think, get the essence and the heart of what the group, work group said. They were much less about how to do it and more what do we need? What, how do we need this to work for us? Um, and so through that process, we really captured, I think, kind of the heart, and that's what Megan's gonna speak from about in the spirit of these recommendations. Um, we also then started working at what would those core strategies be to really get us to those short-term outcomes, recognizing that some of these are gonna take longer. And so what are some of those initial things that we can do now to really make a difference as we move forward? Um, we also, from the work group and taking it back at the division level, really identified some uh, lead staff at the Early Learning Division to really make these happen and really thought about how this connects to other work within the division and so did some initial thinking in terms of where these align between the Early Learning Council strategic plan, um, the equity subcommittee report, as well as the QIS equity plan of really how do we bring this all together to, to, to meet the needs of our system from what we've heard. Um, you'll also see in the document um, through the, is that there's some appendix appendices that really lay out the work group a little bit in more detail but as well as the rich conversation we tried to capture that I think we'll, that I know we will really use moving forward as we continue this work and then a draft project plan that really starts timelining out some of those key strategies and the tasks that need to have happen um, and so that's kind of the essence of the report and so if we Kind of jump back and think about the recommendations around parent referral um, to early learning services you know es essentially what the work group came up with is that we need a place to have is a one-stop shop for families 24 hours in what with what they need what's reasonable what what they have access and what they care about and so to create a centralized data system that really looks at that work additionally what we heard is that really needs that follow-up component that a system alone isn't enough. It really takes that ongoing follow-up for families to really make sure that they get the services they need when they need them and how they need them. Um, and so I, I want to kind of invite Megan to kind of share from, from your perspective of participating in terms of the spirit of these. Okay, so my, na my name is Megan Garecki. Um, 
And like I said, it was a privilege to work for this group. I'm a huge advocate for anything to do with education for my kids or any children, basically. Um, with this group, I was really excited to work on this project. Um, my, I have two children, a second grader and a three-year-old. I was trying to get my daughter into preschool. I made 40 different phone calls. I called 211. They gave me a list of phone numbers to call. I called them. They all had their list of questions. The last question on the questionnaire was, what is your income? I tell them, you don't qualify. Or we had to pay like $800 a month or 200 or something. I could not find childcare based on my husband's income because we make too much. <laughs> um, so working on this project was really good for me because I was able to tell them this is what I had to go through. Uh, we also made a questionnaire that we, I took back to my families at Earl Boyles and had them answer what is working for you with childcare or preschool? What is not working? The number one thing was I can't find information on preschool unless they've already got an older child in the system, either in school or already in preschool. If it's their first kid, they have no idea where to go. They make phone calls. They don't know what to do. Um, the 40 people I called, well, a little bit over 40, um, I got no call back to make sure that I got a hold of somebody. Um, they just told me, oh, well, you need to call this place. I call that place. They say, oh, you need to call over here. And it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, I gave up. Um, the only reason why my daughter did get into a preschool was because of where my son goes to school. Um, knowing the right people he doesn't or my daughter does not go to earl boyles preschool because we live two feet out of the earl boyles district but from knowing people the right people at the right time at the right place i was able to get her placed in a preschool i personally don't find that that's right i think we need a one-stop shop kind of like Fred Myers, where you can go and buy basically everything you need, whether it's a phone number or a website, you put in what you are looking for, a child care, preschool, <coughs> whatever you need, and they give you a list of what the requirements are so that you don't have to make all these phone calls and then be told you don't qualify. It will tell you these are the requirements um, because I know for me hearing you don't qualify I'm sitting back there like how do we not qualify you know we're a one income family um, you're doing great Megan yeah, what else do you want job. us to know <laughs> I just want families in Oregon to be able to have somewhere to go to find the care that they need, especially first time moms, because with my son, honestly, I didn't even know I had to enroll him for kindergarten. Like three weeks before school started, my mom was like, did you enroll your son? Did you enroll JR in school? I'm like, oh, I didn't know I had to. Mm -hmm. I thought it was done. I, first time mom, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So especially for first time moms, they don't know the, where to go, how to get the information, and we really need that information out there. We really do. I think Thanks. Eva has a question or a comment. Uh, Megan, thank you so much. It takes a lot of um, uh, courage to get up in front of a bunch of strangers and share. Um, I still am getting used to it after several years. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, 
your story mm -hmm. is something that I hear throughout all income levels too. Is it's not you know it, like how do I find childcare? How do I find preschool? How do I find you know out what I'm supposed to do? Um, so I you know, I hear it from my friends, yeah. random people, yeah. um, <laughs> it, and so yeah. I, I appreciate that you're bringing it yeah. to the forefront. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to back up was that, that there's no follow through. You're kind of like given this information yes. and then put out into the world yes. and said like pretty much like good luck. Yes. And when you're you're swimming in this gigantic sea of, oh my God, what am I, uh -huh. what am I supposed to do? Yes. How do I find the best thing? Um, I think having that, uh, you know, that extra little phone call, mm -hmm. hey, were you able to find what you needed? Were yeah. you able to find something that works for you? Yeah, and I think that is in here that, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, with the one place, uh, whether it's the, <clears throat> in, you know, a website or a phone number, somebody will contact you and make sure that you got somewhere, you got the information that you needed. Right. Because I, the personal touch kind of, you know, would have helped me out a whole lot because I was getting so frustrated and stressed out that if somebody would have called me and just been like, did you get anywhere? Right. If not, let me try and help you out. I think that would have helped quite yeah. a bit. I didn't. The other thing I hear a lot and know too is that when people try to find childcare or preschool, you have to start searching well before you even think about it. Like I was even late looking for childcare, but was very fortunate to know some people. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so that's how my daughter got into preschool. Is right. Knowing people. Right, and that's that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. I mean, and so how you know, they, we talk about how childcare, preschool, whatever it is, it's unaffordable, and it's not because you know the the people doing the work are making a lot of money, right. but like, how do we build this and make it uh, um, accessible to all families and uh, something that that people want to do because they're honored in it through a, a paycheck and the satisfaction. I know um, a, one of the moms at our school who's pregnant who has already put her child on the head start when you got to do it because there's such yeah so. Aaron and then uh, Kali. That was actually going to be my question is whether the group talked about having some way and I know this is hard because we're trying to do this actually in the long-term care system in and it's hard for parents to be able to anticipate adequately the time lag so you know I went through the same thing with my kids it was 17 months for me to get my first child into child care and your your anxiety ridden we're on four lists you know we go through the whole process of searching all of these places and you're not sure because you ha you're working and you're nervous and it's coming. So did the group talk at all about access to availability and accessibility as an issue? And what was the recommendation there? Yeah, it, it really talked about don't tell me services that aren't an option for me and my mm -hmm. family. They really wanted to have a, some, some type of system, the resource to be realistic for them. Um, I think it's going to be hard and challenging. I think part of the connection that really came out was that it's about child care and finding child care, but it's also Head Start, home visiting, relief nurseries, that if we <coughs> create it, um, the gamut of early learning services, that by having someone skilled doing those referrals, thinking b broadly, that we'll be able to, the intent is to try to have you thought about child care yet? Have, wh where are you at with that? I think came out, I think that's a lot of the work to figure out how to do that um, moving but forward. It, were you thinking it would go so far as to say, well, this facility is currently closed to new enrollment, but if you can wait a year, you could put your child on. I mean, I, is it that, was that level? Because I, I think that's one of the dilemmas in this process is, I mean, I know relief nurseries have wait lists. I know that almost Everybody. all of these programs have more demand than they have. Uh, services and so I just was wondering how that if that was that part of it it was in the recommendations of that we need to figure it out mm -hmm. definitely not a solution in there yet okay. yeah. Yeah. 
And I'm, I'm a follow-up. Is there somebody that works in your long-term care unit where you've been puzzling this out for a different population? Yeah, but I was going to say, I think we could talk to. It would be a great connect because yeah. we we just launched this um, statewide network called the Aging and Disability Resource Connection Network, and we did an evaluation of two one one, and we realized pretty quickly that. In this case, because we wanted people to be able to have what we call options counseling, we wanted people to be able to have more robust conversation with people about, in, you know, income, all people, not just low-income people. So these um, these are operated through our AAA system. And we have a training curriculum for the options counselors, and then we have these ambitions around these databases so that people can actually tell, well, there are this many foster care placements for seniors available in your community. You know, the converse here would be, or the analogy here would be, there are this many slots available in your community with this many providers. And what it would do then for us as a system um, supporter, we're not an operator because this is a private market system but what it would do for us is it would also then give us a better sense of where the gaps are so through that system now we are ho in the future we can't do it now we are hoping that we could see wow there are 12 parents in this community who have called and have been looking for this kind of care and we have none and then we would know more about that and we would be able to have those kind of conversations so yes we can connect it's I think there are similarities even though the populations are on you know cradle to grave here but I think right. the, the ideas are pretty similar mm -hmm. Kali Terry Bobby um, so I what you said Michelle I appreciate your candor and it resonated with me as well and I have a three and six year old and um, when I I'm in education, my career is in education that I did not know about enrollment times. And there's just so much lack of transparency around what to do with your children. And, um, you know, with, with at the time I'm, I still am a mom working outside the home too, there's very little time that you have to even think about it. And yeah. so the ease at which um, things are available is so important. And I wondered, one of the things that I found in looking for childcare beyond knowing sort of the cost and the um, ratios and you know some of the, the content pieces uh, was how culturally responsive are they? Um, I have African American children <laughs> and I wanted to know that this is going to be an environment that they would thrive in, that they would be seen in, that they would be heard in. And I wonder how much the group really grappled with this because I think across income levels, um, I know mothers of color think about this, particularly black um, parents. I talk about it with my friends all the time or anyone that has a black child, frankly, whether, whether or not the moms are. I end up. <laughs> okay. And so, and what did that yield? Um, in sort of how we change the system because I I did call child care resource and referral when I had my oldest and I didn't trust that they were giving me any inform like they didn't give me a lot of information just like you could look here here and here based on my neighborhood and I thought that's not telling me if my child's gonna thrive and be accepted and so yeah I'm curious about that conversation on the parent referral okay. <laughs> um, Valen Brown of the Black Parent Initiative was part of the group, um, and she brought that up, that um, she wanted a way to make sure that like, her children would be surrounded by people that look like them, by ki kids that look like them, and not just a bunch of white kids running around, basically. Um, and we did talk about um, trying to find a way um, I don't know if it made it into the recommendations but we did discuss trying to find a way to um, um, hold on I can't think of the word to let parents know you know yes your children will have their um, well, it's how to find more, like give more information that would be helpful to families to fit their values, their location, what, what fits. And so yeah. a lot of it was around how do we give more information than just phone numbers? It falls into that follow-up component. And what is the information that matters to families? And so 
um, as this work gets mm -hmm. scoped out, I th think some of that's reflected in the principles that will continue to drive this work as it moves forward. But I think it's it was definitely a, a large point of the conversation um, that we need to make sure happens. And so, and along those lines, I mean, I think you also highlighted, you talked about the one-stop shop, and I actually thought about, when I had my oldest, I had a friend in England who had a kid at the same time, and all of the services that she got when she had her baby, and I think oh, it speaks yeah. to this larger issue around the system, mm -hmm. really not supporting moms, whether they're first-time moms, second, third-time moms, and so was there a lot of visionary talk around what this system can be to better support mothers? You threw out the one, I don't know if the one-stop shop just came to you today. It, it or, did. Yeah, <laughs> but so I was curious, like, were there conversations about how do we change the system in a, in a more dramatic way than just tinkering uh, to really ensure that mothers and, you know, other family members are getting the information they need? I uh, add yes. Support things. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big points of conversation was around trust mm -hmm. and, and, and who you get that information from matters. And so, yes, we need to have sort of this universal approach that, mm -hmm. that has the continuum of early learning services that are far more than just one, one segment of our system, but the full. But then how do we equip people um, who have trusting relationships with other, whether parents or or other individuals in the community so that the information can be um, heard and, <coughs> and, and that there's a, a process of building trust. We didn't talk through all the details, but we did talk about sort of who would that be and where could that look like mm -hmm. and know that those are some of the things that we'll be exploring as we go through. It's really an important issue is, one, it's information, but it's also sort of who carries the message, you know. Well, and. Last point, <laughs> I would urge everyone, I mean, this is very personal to me because I have young children, and I know what the data says about particularly African-American boys and their outcomes, and I also know what the data says about how important the early years are, and we have two working parents in our household, so we cannot be there with the kids. So where my child is matters so much, and it is something that is so stressful to me as a mother, and I think every mother I know that's in the same position. And I know, you know, lower income families, there's even more stresses that they're dealing with, but I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to get this right because it's a big deal um, and the systems are not set up right now to support our kids like all along and we still <laughs> see things happening in the k-12 system that pushes them out so these early years are like you feel like if i can just find the right space and knowing what the right space could be. I know pedagogically what's good around how children learn, but those spaces have zero diversity in staff, and, in ch and so you're left with these dilemmas. And so being really intentional and finding supports for families, I think, is so important. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Charles, this is Marlene. <laughs> well, right after um, Terry, Bobby, um, Lynn too. Um, Krista? Yes, Krista, Lynn. <laughs> Your next. Okay. So uh, there's there's two. Oh. Hi, Harriet. Hey, Harriet. <laughs> okay. So two things came up out of your conversation that I think are are really important that um, we haven't quite grappled with and um, I just want to add my own motherhood piece each of my children was in a child care that was closed by the state for um, a licensing violation so with a family that had resources um, had income and was pretty much able to choose uh, child care is stressful and um, for every one of us um, one thing you brought up that we haven't really grappled with is the unregulated nature of preschool um, that's a piece of it. Pre okay. Preschools are not regulated unless there are also child care. And so um, we haven't really grappled with that piece about what does that look like in the state. And I don't think most parents understand that preschools aren't regulated. And so when they set their child down and, you know, what are they getting for their dollar? And, and we need to do a better job of explaining that to families. Um, the second piece that I just, for the staff, I really want you to, think about is there are hubs that are um, quite a bit ways down the road in building regional uh, referral systems. Um, Kim and I are part of one. Mm -hmm. um, so I would really be 
I would caution you to not create some statewide system that doesn't take into account the regional systems that are being built. Um, we see we hear a lot of value in our local community about um, uh, the one-stop shop. How do you have the one-stop shop and the no wrong door? And um, boy, that's an interesting thing to try to figure out. But uh, I think we've got a pretty good handle on it in our community about how we're going to manage to do that. But um, it just I think there are a lot of things at play in how communities um, work. And, and just in defense of child care resource and referral, they haven't been allowed to give you very much information in the past. QRIS is going to do a lot about that, but, you know, they can't, couldn't give you an opinion. And so that's, I think they, they would like to <laughs> sometimes, but they can't. So. Thank you. Bobby. Okay, I have a couple things. One, one the research is really clear um, that uh, high uh, low income or high risk families um, uh, trust is a screen through which they go and they won't even consider so uh, the research tells all kinds of stories about leaving their child with a drug using brother because he's safe um, but wouldn't take a child to a center because it's strangers Anyway, so this role of trust, I just want to say it's huge for the population we care about and we do need to figure out the vast majority of all income, all races, use, um, fam use were friends and neighbors to find arrangements. They don't use any system. Um, and that has a lot to do with trust too. If, you, if my sister was happy here, I know I'm going to be safe there and so it's anyway so the people who don't have a sister or a cousin or, or you know whoever um, with that kind of information are the thing I think people were really targeting and then we have to deal with this issue of trust if we want to get to but there are a couple of things one the um, a lot of what we're talking about is data having the providers give us information that they are not current they give the r and r a lot of information but they don't give information about um some of these value oriented things that people are, are want or uh equity kinds of questions so i think we should need to talk about that the second thing is they can't nobody can tell you if somebody has a vacancy or not because it changes every single day and so if we don't so I just another plug for data is that we create both systems that um, this is these are free market folk out there they are not being paid by anybody so they uh, except the parents for the most part so it's a, a system that will they would use to update vacancies on so that you had a database that could allow somebody to tell you that somebody has a waiting list of x length and somebody has uh, openings and whatever okay so so i think the data is huge additional fields strategies both uh, electronic updating um, ease and incentives of some kind for the providers to keep it and the other thing I want to say on data stay local uh, not all child care in Oregon is regulated um, it doesn't mean it's bad and it doesn't mean that families don't want to find it families do want to find it like all the preschools that you talked about they're not regulated um, and so the r and R's is right now the only way you can the only comprehensive list we have is the because the r and R's but they know it because they go out there and find it you know under every rock they can can so there's a local component that so when we talk about you know it's kind of um, when you put together state and local, there may be a real advantage to a, a, a parent access point that is statewide, but I feel very strongly you'll that we'll lose a lot if the data is not local because that's how you that's find it. that's how you find it. Somebody can't sit in Salem 
and find what's what's out there. Anyway, so um, those the the those seemed really <coughs> important to me just to to build into the planning is um, based on all our years of of. Um, knowing and and working with the hubs um i i don't know where it fits but i've been thinking uh, the same thing that um somehow the hubs are trying to get families to these same services so there's got to be some sweet point in making all this out i do want to say i hope nobody is underestimating how expensive it is to do this dream Calling parents back is far more difficult than it sounds mm -hmm. because they're never there when you call right. back. <laughs> um, and um, so that means how many times do you try before you, I mean, it's a, it, it, and taking as long as people need, that's why um, DHS pays extra for their families is to take that time. But it's, I think it's absolutely wonderful but I hope we don't think you can do it cheap. Because yeah. right. there's and nothing cheap about um, right. connecting with parents in a meaningful, appropriate way. Well, so that's, we developed this, I just want to okay. we developed this dream of what uh -huh. we want, and now what we're figuring out is, okay, what are the practical steps that we take in that direction? But we want it, but this, conver and this conversation is feeding even more of our thinking. I can see it happening. Yeah. I know what they look like when they think. Um, <laughs> and I can see it, I can see dots getting connected. So just want to put that out there. What, what we do over the course of the next few years will be steps toward this aspiration that we're talking about right now. Sorry, Mr. Oh, you're good. So before Lynn, I uh, want to remind sort of the audience, if you would love to make public comment, if you want to make public comment, please make sure you sign up, which is in the back. So Lynn? A um, couple things. First, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave um, to go across the street. And that's, I apologize. But um, I did want to say a couple things. Um, first of all, we have much experience in this state with big dreams um, that are aspirational um, not sufficiently disciplined and um, produce disasters mm -hmm. and um, and and I'm just you know I'm just my agency is in the post phase of such a adventure and it has ramifications for the population forget what it does to my agency or what it does to legislators or the people of Oregon it has very serious ramifications for the population um, we have a Medicaid population now that is struggling mightily with the post phase of big dreams with insufficient implementation. So what we need to do is be practical. We need to prevent mission creep and we need to stay focused. And one of the things that I think we need to factor in here, which is a, a function of my age, when I went into the marketplace and looked for daycare, um, at the time, I was the only person in my company that had a baby and was working after the baby was born. So, um, and it was a very interesting experience. And it was in, you know, in Portland, Oregon, uh, decades ago. And there were two options, right? Two options for, I lived in Northeast Portland. So my, and it was through the child care referral service. I called them up and they said, great, there are two options, here they are. And, it could take a year to two years or so I think there are two takeaways from my experiences one is that was a long time ago and now we have this and I understand that personal touch is important I also understand that if I could have 30 years ago sat down which I've just done and entered a whole bunch of complex data about preschool and daycare and everything I could not have gotten what I can now get on the internet and yes I have to go make phone calls and yes then you have to have some supports build around you know what do you do how does it work all that but I think it's really important to build on what is in place that's my strong admonition mm -hmm. and second of all as someone who's spending huge amounts of time creating a system that works for people after everyone dream big and let mission scope creep beyond reality and beyond affordability, I would make a plea for the population 
that get served to keep this really simple and build on what exists and to to not let any dreams get beyond um, functionality because as we look back nationally we've had millions of people now hundreds of millions of people and as we look back at what worked in other states um, with Medicaid it was uh, the bright shining stars were the states that kept it simple kept it small and understood you have to walk before you run and um, and then there's other states like ours that are on the other end of that continuum and it creates again I want to go back the people who are most adversely affected are the people needing the services and we just we got to not get out over our skis Krista. I just uh, second what folks have said already, especially in relationship to the early learning hubs and some of the work that's already gone there around creating networks and thinking of systems. Um, and then I have two questions, one of them with hopefully a chance to follow up. Um, one of them has to do with the language that I've heard you speak to and also that's in the recommendation around um, uh, early learning services and I also heard a continuum of services. But it sounds also that what we're talking about is child care preschool. So I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit between those things and when it comes to the database, are we talking or what the centralized system, are we talking specifically about child care and, and preschool and those systems or maybe do we see it in a phase process or could you say a little bit about what the group talked about in that regard? Yeah, I, I think the group in terms of short term, long term outcomes really recognize that you know, kind of the dream would be something that connects all services. In the interim, kind of really starting with those services that we already have connections with. Okay. And so that's the starting point. And so it would be thinking about across parent education, how do we connect that child care, Head Start, Relief Nursery, so home visiting, those pieces that as a council we all, you're working on, that's our starting point for that continuum of where they're at. And then the, um, thank you, that's very helpful. Then for the implementation, uh, actually, can I follow up? So it sounds like what you're building is not meant to displace existing work. It's meant to create the kind of system that at some point, that would build on what exists and at some point could be interoperable or connect with other systems in the aspirational future. But at, and, but at this point, it's really about trying to build on what already exists <coughs> and make some connections. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I think in a lot of realms it's really going to look like an enhancement to some programs, but it's a way to, to really bring it all into a centralized place that both families and service providers within the community can look at the different options. Okay. Um, and then the other question um, was on that timeline, actually. It looks like there's some pretty um, heavy implementation timelines around August through October for draft RFP with RFP happening in November. It can, is, that, is, is that a whole new system? Or could you say just to some of the comments Lynn made about going slow and kind of thinking this through and the two-year plan, could you say a little bit about how those plans link with that kind of conceptual notion of being thoughtful in the next couple of months? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, this has been a conversation that's been happening for a, a long time in terms yeah. of thinking about it. And so I think really scoping out and putting out RFP and see what's out there in terms of ability to do this work. I mean, I'm excited to have some conversations um, in the near future around what, what can those options of care kind of look like um, of lessons learned to really draft that RFP and see what, what we get. But really scoping that out um, and, and yeah, we, there, it's an ambitious, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the timeline and it is a, f a first look and I think we have to see what comes in the door. So then the last piece and then I'll thank you for the opportunity, but anecdotally, um, when, when we were working with two on one and thinking about this, um, I think there, there are so many lessons to learn about what has worked and what hasn't worked. And one of the things that we found was um, really uh, valuable around this was that local connection. Like, yes, the system, and also that local connection that is not just about connecting with the families, but keeping the information up to date about how all of that works. And that proved to be something of a challenge, primarily because it was significantly costly, right, to, to maintain all of that, um, and even just identifying the universe. So just 
for consideration. It, it was it, a challenge, and I think also a worthy opportunity. So thank you for this amazing work, and thanks, Mom, for being here. Uh, Marlene and then Harriet. <laughs> um, the providers can't provide, can't really provide that additional support that we're seeing in the research that is helpful. You know, reading, constantly talking, doing all this activity with the child um, early on, and so, and especially when when you're looking at, um, you know, as far as my child goes, I have time to add that uh, those additional developmental activities with him um, when I'm with him. But you know, I'm thinking of families that are socioeconomically and also uh, just culturally we have you know the, the cultural issues as well that may hinder developmental um, growth and, and they're relying on child care providers to help them with this and you know due to the ratio issues um, their, their child their children are just not getting it has this group discussed that at all Marlene, um, it's really a great point you raise. That, that's, that was really outside of the charge that we had in front of us, talking about parent referral services. However, great point, and thank you for raising it. Okay. Thank you. The second question I had um, was more about um, also, you know, I'm interested that you have parents um, uh, in this group and just curious if, if um, funding, you know, the current methods of funding, um, preschools and child care services um, was discussed as far as providing more funding mm -hmm. in this area than is currently, than currently exists. Um, and what they could do to maybe advocate for that. You mean funding to have for, um, to, to increase access to programs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. In, the early, in this early learning sector. Um, so preschool access, you know, more preschool accessibility, um, possibly Marlene, this is Megan. I'll take that question. That is, was really outside the scope of what this group was, the problem that this group was working to solve. Um, but it is something that we've been working on through the course of this legislative session through our advocacy to um, get additional funding for preschool and um, to be able to expand preschool services into a variety of settings. Um, it's also been a part of our advocacy around increasing the state allocation for employment-related daycare. And then on the infant and toddler side, we've, side, we've been advocating to expand um, access to home visiting. So it's, it, we don't have enough access to services in our state, um, and we've been tackling that problem legislatively. This group was thinking about what do we need to do to get parents connected to what is available. And then in terms of resource, and, and we're going to need to do that work this next biennium mm -hmm. within the scope of the resources we have access to already and perhaps use our funding to purchase different things to get different outcomes. Um, but we, haven't, we have not yet had a legislative conversation about increased funding for the type of work that this group was, was charged with thinking about. We have been talking to the legislature about expanding access to early learning services Period. Sure. I was just thinking that as they were discussing what is available, yeah. to the, the, that they would be uh, that they would be coming. That what one of the issues that they would be seeing is that there's that there's need for more resources. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marlene. That's really great. Uh, Doctor Dare. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, what I was uh, going to say is that um, some of the things I'm going to say have already been brought up. But because the difference, there's obviously a, a difference in what is available and accessible and the need in one part of the state versus another part of the mm -hmm. state. So I was just kind of wondering, did they take a look at it from a, a broad view or was the view from this part of, our, of the, uh, um, from this part of the state, this part of the region, and this is what we know is there. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I think this is Dawn, and we had representation across the state, and they were really coming from the approach um, around what is the need from the family's perspective, um, and so and locally, how does that connect, and, and what does that look like? And then I think that that's then the charge to take what the family needs and figure and and take that that spirit and figure out how do we make that be a part of the outcome that's achieved through this work so they didn't dive in that deep in terms of the how it was more on the what my other question then is i'm glad to hear uh, the mom perspective and the hmm. parents perspective because it's always something that somehow gets not heard as hmm. frequently and uh, in my world is it Mm. Do we have all of the yeah I mean I think if you're That's looking in the document some of the appendix and that that was kind of probably weaved throughout as far as what's what is working where what do we have but again it, it, a lot of the conversation was about what is the need what what do families need now and I think then we have to look at what is working I think that's some work to still do Great, thank you. Great. All right, any more uh, questions, comments? I think we we didn't walk through the professional development recommendations. Sure. Uh, <laughs> that was only the parent referral. That was one of the work groups. <laughs> um, so maybe we can kind of briefly yes, walk through yes, those. Yes, kind yes. of briefly. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> it was big work. Being brief is hard, but. Um, so this really looked at how do, what do we need in our professional development system, and I think it really talks um, 
looks about where is child care, what are those needs, and really who are the families that are needing child care and what are those challenges and how do we really look at it in terms of making sure that it is reflective of our communities. And so a lot of the recommendations really focus in on that of what are the needs within the different sectors that are caring for young children and how do we leverage our resources, how do we bring them together. So there was a lot of the, the recommendations are really housed around what do we need to do as a state in terms of always looking at our standards, always looking at our expectations, as well as how do we really build up a supply of high quality care settings within some of our most at-risk communities and what is the professional development needs for that and so within the recommendations is really both at a state level what do we need and at the service delivery what do we need and some of the pieces that you'll find is um, in there that that were identified is we need more culturally relevant trainers in our community that are doing the training to child care providers um, within the different varying communities. How do we really beef that up? And how do we really integrate quality across the spectrum? So it's not just about license, license exempt, receiving subsidy, here's professional development for them, here's licensing, and then here's quality. How do we really build that quality across the spectrum of care? And I think that really was the essence and the charge that the work group, you know, what bubbled up and they really brought forward into these recommendations. Eva. So uh, the very first thing that I noticed is that there were people that I admire and respect and who I know know that uh, the system on here, but that there were not any child care providers specifically listed. And so one of the things I run into in my role outside of here is always going back and letting providers know no, this is really supposed to help you. And having to have this really uphill discussion where it comes from uh, feeling like I don't believe that it is something that's meant to help me. I don't believe that I wasn't included or nobody from that, that does the day-to-day -day work that I do has been included and given input. So it, I, it takes a lot more work to then bring them up to speed, make them comfortable with like, hey, no, actually this is, a, and, then act, and then go back and say, hey, you know what, here are the concerns and here's, and here, you know, like with 3380 as an example, I spent a whole entire weekend online discussing that. And um, I think if, you know, we, I, you know, it, we all know that it's very difficult to get their in, uh, input, but we need to find a way to do that. Um, we can't, we can't constantly say we're doing this for your improvement, and have them be comfortable and have them ready to buy in, without you know, unless we're including them. Um, that yeah, so that was my biggest note that I had written. <laughs> um, because I think, I, I think, too, they're going to be able to say, logistically, I don't know how I would do this or that, or, yeah, I could make that work, you know. So I think it is really important. I mean, I know that some of the people on the, on the group would be able to give a little bit of that insight, but, again, I think just having a provider to give that the extra buy-in, that would be great. Um, can I do a couple? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I obviously spent some time with this. Uh, I can ask those, that question. Um, one of the things on page 22, it says transparent about fees. These are, for, I guess, for provider supports. Uh, transparent about fees, scheduled programs, that area. Um, I made a note about what are the supports for providers who aren't computer savvy or don't have a website or even email because you know we still have providers that you know their job is providing child care and that's what they're focused on and they haven't really de <coughs> dove into the realm of computers and it's scary for them um, so I had that and 
uh, 23, the on parent educator, I really like this statement about voluntary and one <coughs> choice in uh, and one choice in menu of options where parents support uh, parent support parent connections can be in a choice where they would like to participate. I think that that's really important for a lot of people. Make it comfortable for them. Um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, on page 26, the baseline of training for centers is now at 15 hours, should be the same for all types of providers. Um, so I was just curious, is that like, are we suggesting a move towards consolidating the types of licensing because currently we have the registered, certified, and what would that look like? And I suppose that that would, you know, like, what does that look like for ratios? What does that look for hiring? What does that look for just access and, and cost too? So I was curious about that. Um, and then also on that page in the second or the third column, the, the changing expectations of what child care or changing expectations of what child care providers have when starting privacy of ho own home to shift to shift thinking, strong introduction to child care. So um, I said my my initial reaction to that comment was that there is a dual privacy need there. This is their own home that their family, not only them, but their family is sharing with other families and children. So how do we honor and respect that, that family's privacy? But then there's also the, that, uh, that ownership and desire as a business owner to have, like, this is my business. I have pride in this, and I want to be able to run my business just like any other business owner would. So, you know, like... How do we honor that, you know, that dual privacy need and the autonomy that they need, but also like set the expectations? So, I, you know, that just that just really jumped out. You know, like I think a lot of providers might bristle at that statement right there. Um, so maybe it goes back to our how we communicate things. Um, on the license exempt. There were uh, mentions of trainings, free trainings. I think that free trainings would be good for providers of all types, and I know that they are, are available. Can I ask, what are you, what are you looking, looking at? at? Yeah. On the work group development notes, they were in our packet. There is there was the appendix that started to capture oh, just sorry. the conversation you know what, of guys, the work yeah. group, and not in, and so as we, didn't we print those for these books. So is that's oh, that's oh, the oh, appendix okay. that we did send out, but yeah. it's just it's like verbatim like comments that people made in meetings uh, so I these are seen not it, but I didn't see yeah. it here so I those are not like early learning division opinions those are people in the work group, group so that you could actually see the like the comments from the conversation oh I was not clear on that I yeah. guess it was yeah. like because so I was like those are people's, oh, like, yeah, those are people's opinions okay yeah yeah, yeah. Um, that is better. I guess I didn't really notice that that was what the case was because I was like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> <I'm so lost. laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I was like, where did all this come from? This was you know, so. Thank you. That makes me. But I think it was good. It was, it was good to get me thinking, and I wasn't sure how everybody else. You know, obviously, I spent <laughs> some time waiting to hear back from other people at the legislature on some other things. So I was like, yeah, I got my packet. Um, so yeah, I think, well then I will just leave those be then and <laughs> follow up with some other things. But I, I, you know, that was my, you know, the main thing I was like, oh gosh, we didn't have a provider. And then some of the other language things. So sorry, I didn't mean to delve into notes. You're good. <laughs> Kali? Yeah, I guess I, I want to just push a little back on the notion that thinking big means expensive and, you know, something that is unattainable and messy. I think when I say thinking big, I'm talking about thinking differently. I, what I don't want is the same system that's slightly tinkered, but looks essentially and functions essentially the same. I think there are a lot of assets in the community that are untapped. There are a lot of partnerships that are unexplored. There are ways to align different pieces that are already there that don't cost extra money that could help the system be better. I think there are voices that are still not at the table that need to be heard. So when I say that, I, 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 I want to be clear that it is not spending a lot more money to produce something big and fancy, but truly looking at what assets are in the community. I think 
uh, Harriet's point as, as well, knowing what works and what doesn't, and maximizing that, partnering with school districts. Like, there are so many things that I think aren't working. There are great things happening, <laughs> and I think there are things working. But I think when we look at the population we say we are focused on, based on our goals as an early learning council, um, there are th they're not, their needs are not being met to the extent that they could be. And um, my hope is that we really take it seriously. I think it's an opportunity. Um, yeah, I could go on, but from what I've talked to providers um, on the provider side of the network, and there's a lot not working for providers, and um, a lot of them are home-based certified caregivers um, that, you know, the trainings are inaccessible, the point system, I mean, and I actually am not deep into the system to really know, <laughs> like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is what you should consider instead. I, I just know that they have real concerns, and I know I've talked to you about that, Heidi, um, in my paltry participation yeah. <laughs> participation in the group yeah. but um, yeah. yeah so I just I want to underscore that because I fear I guess I feared you guys thinking we can't do anything different and that, that I think that would be a shame and I guess we respectfully disagree with the idea that we just do small steps I think we need to take some large steps to yield better outcomes for kids so for time management hey, want to thank Thank you. So uh, just with time management, if we could sort of wrap up here, uh, it'd be great. Is that all you have? That, that's, yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thank Thanks, sir. Thank Bye -bye. you, Megan. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Amy. I'll just jump in um, and give a really quick presentation. <laughs> um, so I talked to you all last at the last Early Learning Council meeting about our sort of high-level communication strategy for the Early Learning Division. Um, and so I brought that presentation back, but we're going to skim through a lot of it again. I'm going to talk about sort of where some, some of the work stands and how it connects to what's happening later today when we're launching Room as a state. So. Um, as I mentioned last time, I always like to start with the goals of the early learning system and the council because communication should always be in the service of these goals. So when we, when we put together this strategy, we're not thinking about just how do we get more people to know about all the things we want them to know about, but we're thinking about how do we use communication strategically to help us achieve our goals. So <clears throat> the strategies sort of fall in this pyramid. Um, the bottom level being really around clarifying and articulating our role and value so that the lack of clarity doesn't get in the way of good work and folks sort of know what it is we're doing, um, how we're planning to achieve our goals. And that's us as the Early Learning Division that's supporting hubs to do this work to clarify their role and value, um, other partners. And then if we do that well, um, being able to build relationships and leverage community assets. So the state is not always going to be the right person to communicate about things or to know things. And we have to connect with partners across the state to be the early learning communications channels. Um, and as was mentioned a number of times today, there's so much good work going on in communities uh, that the state does have an opportunity to elevate um, in ways that smaller organizations might not have that opportunity to do. So that's the next piece. And then the top there is really then around what role can the state play in supporting children and families to succeed and connecting families to supports and services. So if we know what it is we're doing, what our value is, what we're saying to people about that value, 
we're leveraging our partners and helping elevate their good work and creating those two-way communications channels with partners, um, then we can all be driving towards this connecting families to services, supporting children and families to succeed. Um, this kind of goes along with what I just said, but this is sort of our the audience ripple. So knowing that we have um, an early learning staff that is out in communities all the time, we have 70 some folks in licensing and compliance in nine offices across the state who talk to lots of childcare providers and early learning service providers. So trying to be really intentional about our staff feeling knowledgeable and supported to be sort of the first lines of communication. And then moving out from there, if we can do that well, our partners, CCRNRs, hubs, other agency partners can be well informed to be that next level of communication, funneling out to providers, advocacy organizations, legislators who we want to be our champions, um, and then families and communities. So these next pieces go through varying audiences and really talk about <clears throat> sort of instead of thinking about what we need these folks to do, thinking about what their needs are around our work. So whether that's being an informed champion, um, whether that's being able to have autonomy and respect in their lives and being able to find the services they need, and then really what we expect from that engagement. So this one is specific around families and communities, um, but we've heard here today and in a lot of other arenas, access to desired culturally and linguistically relevant services and supports, and then really dignity and respect and autonomy in their work. So families don't want to be told what to do. As much information as those of us in this room have, they want to be supported and they want to know how to access what they need, but they also know a lot. <laughs> they don't want to be told what to do. So recognizing that in our communications and engagement work. And then if we do that well, what we're really hoping is that we have informed partners, that, that families um, are partners in this work, they're co-creators of this work with us, that they're engaged, um, and that they're powerful advocates for other families and for early learning. So I went through a lot of this last time, some of the work we've done in each of those buckets of the pyramid. Um, but what I'll focus on for my last couple minutes is around this supporting family, children and families to succeed. So as part of the Race to the Top grant, we have a whole piece of work that's focused on public access around connecting families to supports and services and information. So we've put together a um, public access engagement team, public access advisory group, to help us frame up what that public access work looks like. <clears throat> and they are a group of community-based organization leaders, um, hub leaders, and then state folks who manage programs um, that serve families. And what we started with talking to the group about was uh, we want to start with parent voice as our guiding, our guiding information. Um, and so we talked to the group about should the state be going out to do focus groups on what families want? Um, there's some of that help happening in other arenas. Should we do a, a large survey? And a lot of the members of the group said, we do a lot of that already. As community-based organizations or as hubs, we've done focus groups. We have like our parent union manifesto. We have a lot of information about what families want. We have to act on it. And so what we did instead of recreating the wheel is we collected um, different pieces of that parent voice information. So Head Start surveys and information um, from Earl Boyle's parent engagement work, um, from the Lane Early Learning Hub, and we sort of pulled it all together and said, what are some of the common themes parents are sharing? And a lot of it landed in these four buckets um, that you see in front of you. Cultural competence, access, basic needs, and the impact of trauma. So really cultural competence came up a lot as as important as access. And Kali mentioned this too, that it's, it's one thing to say we have a lot of services that families can connect to, but if they're not culturally relevant, it doesn't matter, honestly, how many services there are if they're not what families want. So it was an important piece that that's elevated at the same level as access or basic needs. Um, the access one we talked a lot about today. The basic needs 
it goes back to, you know, there may be things that we're focused on around preschool or childcare or whatnot, but if families have other issues on their mind, we can't ignore those. So we have to think about how we partner with, collaborate with systems that are helping families address needs holistically and treating families as holistic entities that have lots of different needs. Um, so that's where we started, and as we started to get into conversation about, so with that in mind, what does it look like to connect families to services? What's the state's role in a campaign that helps do that? Um, we've landed on three buckets, and a lot of these have kind of come up in conversation today as well. But starting at the bottom, what we heard in the room was, we what we don't want to do is just go out with a campaign that says early learning is so important, connect to services, and then everyone gets put on wait lists because there are no services. So the group's first priority was how do we create more comprehensive awareness about the value and importance of early learning, and how do we as a community build, as it's phrased here, um, more priority and policy and budget decisions for early learning. So if we can do that, get more resources for early learning. At the same time, we know there are a lot of um, systems and supports that already serve families and uh, could be improved to do that in a more family-centric way. So we heard today um, around families connecting to services that a, a lot of families will talk about the experience of having to call 40 people or going to a, a meeting with a service provider and having to have separate meetings for each of their children instead of one meeting for all of their children. So um, this family-centric systems piece is really around how uh, do we use culturally relevant engagement approaches to provide access to services and supports that meet the needs of Oregon's diverse communities. So what can we put in place to really have respect and autonomy and dignity in the process of families connecting to services? And then the final bucket there is so if we get more resources for early learning, so there are more spots, more services, making sure those services are really family-centric, then we also know there are a lot of families who will never connect to supports and services, and those services are not going to meet all of their needs. So what can we do to really support families where they are with what they have? Um, and we phrased it here as underserved families have the tools and resources they need to support childhood learning and development. Which brings me to what we're doing this in an hour, which is launching Room. So Room um, is a tool to support families where they are with what they have. Uh, it's a uh, online app, and I, we've talked about Room a little bit in other council meetings, so you might all know this already. Um, it's an online app that will provide daily tools based on your daily activities based on your child's age that are all based in brain research around how ch children develop. So. Um, it's language development and social development um, and the daily app. In addition to the daily app, there's physical resources uh, that also give these tips and tools. And in addition to helping families do the activities that build brains where they are with what they have, it also helps us elevate a conversation about the importance of early learning across the community. So it's sort of twofold. It's the practical, what families can do, and it's helping all of us really elevate the importance of this work. So um, at noon, if you're able to come, or at one, come join us, um, we'll be officially launching our partnership with Room and the Basil Family Foundation and talking about how it's rolling out through pilot sites across the state. That was my, I think that was like so seven much. minutes. Questions? I have and probably more to Megan than to, I think your presentation was great. We haven't ironed all this out, I know, but I really feel like EIECSE should be included in this circle of um, oh, on the audiences. That's my Everything oversight. Everything we talked yeah. about today, um, children, families of children with special needs are in DHS services, have Oregon Health Plan, um, child care, and we haven't figured out all of the rule making and budgeting, but somehow I think for the bigger picture in Oregon, those children need to be included with all other young children. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other comments? We're not sure to see that. Thank you so much, Amy. So I believe we have one public comment.
For the record, I'm Marilee Haas, Executive Director of Oregon Association for the Education of Young Children, and I don't have any formal testimony, just as um, a suggestion ba based on what Amy was just saying about the importance of a style guide for this committee. Throughout the, your printed materials in the meeting, you've referred to work groups for the childhood care and education, you've referred to subcommittees for the equity subcommittee, and you've referred to subcommittees for the birth to three. Make them all equal. Call them all committees since you are a council. And work groups should be reserved for the ad hoc, one time doing work and bringing you a report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, comments, thoughts about today? All right, we're adjourned. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 17 minutes early. Yeah, yeah. 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 feel better. <laughs>